Council, you ready? Just to make a quick record? Sure. Oh. All right, we are on the record this morning. We have Council and Mr. Jackson present. We are outside the presence of the um, jurors in this matter. Um, we're here to make a quick record on the fact, our, I guess, Ms. Garner, one of Mr. Jackson's attorneys, um, had a death in the family um, over the weekend, and um, I guess there's a disagreement about what uh, we should let the uh, jurors know about or how we should inform the jurors of that and explain Ms. Garner's absence. Um, I'm just going to summarize what I understand the uh, preferences to be. My understanding is that uh, Mr. Johnston, Mr. Jackson would like me to inform the jurors that um, Ms. Garner's grandmother passed away that uh, last night, that she is uh, out today dealing with that, and that her presence at the rest of the trial will be day to day. Does that essentially summarize what you're asking that I inform the jury? All right, and on the uh, state's end, my understanding is the state is concerned that um, while the state has obviously expressed its sympathy to Ms. Garner. State is ex, um, state is concerned that uh, by letting the jury know that there was uh, Ms. Garner's grandmother died, that that may engender uh, too much sympathy, mm -hmm. and the state would simply prefer that I inform the jury that there was um, a significant family issue uh, that Ms. Garner had over the weekend, and uh, that's why she's not here today, and that. Um, Again, that her presence at the trial will be day to day from here on out. Is that essentially a correct summary of the state's position and what the state would like me to say? It is, Your Honor. All right. Um, I am going to uh, go along with uh, the state's request in this matter. Um, you know, though I think it's a small risk. I do think there is some risk that they, um, uh, the fact, the facts could engender a sympathy and bring sympathy into this um, as an inappropriate factor uh, by the jury. Again, I think it's a small risk, but it's a risk nonetheless. And so for those reasons, um, I'm going to just simply inform the jury that uh, Ms. Garner had a uh, tragic family event and that, uh, or had a significant family event, is not here today, and that her presence will be day to day. And I'm also going to let the jury know that they're not to infer anything from her absence one way or another. Any further record the state wishes to make? No, Your Honor. Mr. Johnson, on behalf of the defendant? No, Your Honor. All right. Are we ready to bring the jury in?
everyone go ahead and have a seat. All right, while you guys are uh, getting your packets out, I uh, just want to welcome you back. I hope you had a uh, enjoyable weekend. Just want to summarize, you may remember that on uh, Friday, uh, right before 4.30, I think we finished with uh, testimony from uh, Officer Buckles, which was the last witness called by the state on Friday. Um, and I believe we are now prepared to proceed with the state's next witness. <coughs> Um, before we do, if you guys uh, in the front, I know, want a minute to move your chairs a little bit. It's, it's not. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, one other thing before we uh, uh, proceed with the state's next witness. You may notice over at uh, um, the uh, defense table, Ms. Garner is not here today. She had a, um, uh, a significant family issue over the weekend and uh, has uh, understandably needs to deal with that and has been excused. Her presence at the rest of the trial will be day to day. Um, you're not to infer anything one way or another from the fact that, that she's not here. She may join us again, she may not, but again, it's going to be dependent upon her, her circumstances. So with that, um, Mr. Shear, is the state prepared to call its next witness? Yes, Your Honor. You may. Thank you, Your Honor. The state would call Corey Farber to the stand. Good morning, Mr. Barber. You can go ahead and have a seat over there, sir. Mr. Barber, that microphone is live. Uh, okay. You can adjust it however you'd like. So, Mr. Barber, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to swear you in. So, if okay. you please raise your right hand. Sir, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you'll be giving today will be the truth? Yes. All right, you can put your hand down. And then, just for the record, can you please provide us with both your first name and last name and then spell them both? Okay. Uh, Corey, K O R I E, Barber, B A R B E R. All right, Mr. Shear, you may begin your examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, good morning, Officer. How are you? Good. Officer Barber, could you please state your occupation? I'm a police officer at the City of Cedar Rapids. How long have you been employed with the City of Cedar Rapids? About six and a half years. Can you just please give us a brief history of your training and education in order to be a certified peace officer? Uh, so I've been an officer a little over 16 years. Uh, like I said, the last six and a half at Cedar Rapids. Um, my degree background is I have a associate's degree in computer science from Lebec Community College in Kansas. I got two bachelor's degrees from Iowa State, one in sociology and one in criminal justice. And then I also have a master's degree in criminal justice from Simpson College. And Officer Barber, I'm going to have you kind of slow down, please. Okay. And also speak a little bit louder in the microphone, okay? And, sir, are you a certified law enforcement officer throughout the state of Iowa? Yes. What is your current position with the city of Cedar Rapids? Uh, right now I'm patrol with mid-shift, which is 11 a.m. to 9 p.m. Are you assigned to any specific quadrant? No, I'm what they call a wild city car, so I go everywhere. And, once again, when you kind of speak, you kind of drift off, so okay. kind of just stay with that microphone, okay, Officer Barber? Sounds good. Thank you, sir. Can you just briefly describe the duties and responsibility a patrol officer has? Uh, mostly respond to calls um, on day shift and mid shift. Uh, we're pretty call heavy, so that's the majority of our response. And then we have time to do proactive activities. Do you work with anybody when you're on duty? Sometimes, but for the most part, I'm a solo car. I want to direct your attention to the events that occurred on or about June 15 of 2021 in the early morning hours around 8 a.m. through 8.30 a.m. Do you recall this date? Yes. Were you working on this date? I was. What time did your shift begin? I was on day shift at the time, so it began at 7 a.m. Were you working with anybody? No. Were you working as a patrol officer? Yes. And at around 
8.20 a.m. in the morning, were you dispatched to 4414 Oak Leaf Court Northeast? Yes. Why were you dispatched to this location? Uh, dispatch advised that there was a gunshot victim. And when you arrived on scene, was there any other officers present? Yes. Who else was present? Officer Buckles and Officer Brown. And is that Officer Curtis Buckles? Yes. And is that Officer Tim Brown? Yes. Did any other officers eventually join prior to approaching the residence? Yes, uh, Officer Justin Kaczynski and then Sergeant Phil Hanson. And what type of officer is Officer Buckles? A uh, canine officer. Did Officer Buckles have his canine partner with him on that day? Yes. And when you arrived in the neighborhood, where did you and other officers park? Uh, we parked about a block down from the residence. Why did you not park next to the residence? Uh, on the way to the call, it seemed um, it wasn't making a whole lot of sense, so we weren't exactly sure what we had. So for safety reasons, we parked down the street. Um, when we spoke to dispatch, we were trying to get the sister to come outside to the house because dispatch advised that the caller said the sister would meet us outside. And so we were waiting down the street for her to come outside. Did you know at this time how many people were inside the home? No. Were you equipped with a body camera that day? I was. And was it working correctly? Yes. And have you had a chance to review your body cam footage from June 15th of 2021? I have. And when reviewing that footage to show your interactions, approaching the house and making contact with anyone that was inside the house? Yes. Your Honor, at this time, I would like to ask to admit States Exhibit 4, which is a copy of Officer Barber's body cam footage from June 15th of 2021, and I would also ask that it may be published for the jury. Mr. Johnson, any objection? No, All right, then at this time, State's Exhibit 4 is admitted, and you may publish it to the jury. Thank you, Your Honor, and just for timing purposes, it's about 16 minutes long. All right, thank you. Let's see if I can get eyes. All right. Should we approach with the car? I want to go right inside. Okay. See if they can do a search by the address. Mr. Shear, you may resume the video.
This is sounding bullshit. Yeah, and he would be making a shitload of noise. I'm, I'm just going to knock. I, I think this is going to be a swatting deal. I just rang the doorbell. The caller here. I'm good. I'm getting no answer at the door. Can someone look in Eileen to see if there's a phone number for this address? Shot. What the fuck? Get some shots up in the foot then. Oh, shit. 
Sorry. Third victim. Fuck. Third victim? Yeah. Yeah. Who's with me? Hey guys, I need someone here to clear this back here. Okay. Well, I'm gonna... You're gonna go Barbara, through. Barbara, come in front of me. You come in front of me, Barbara? Yep. Yeah. Brown, you go help Kaczynski and then we'll... Right, come on. Watch my back. I want to start here. If you want to hold it. Police department! Sound off if you're here! There's a kitchen back here. I'm going to clear it. Police department! Yeah, I got a garage back here. I'm going to check the garage. inside all the vehicles I didn't see anything. Yeah, that's fine. Well, there's got I'm assuming there's a mother around here somewhere. Coming out. Seven, have medical come around back. We're just going to need a lift assist on the male that's injured. The other three are DOA. Push the medical right and help him out. Okay. He was playing with a round, so. Which one? <coughs> that one right there. Okay. Just, just trying to keep him from moving. We're going to yeah. help you out. I got to put on gloves real quick. Thank you, and then we're going to go to the uh, back porch. Yeah. Okay, what's your name? 
20. Okay. Can we get you? We're going to try Let and me get sneak by her over sneak here. Sneak by over here. Okay. All right. Ready? Okay. One, two, three. Put your weight on your other foot. The other foot. We're going to have to limp out. Well, the rounds on the floor are 22, okay. so. Sister. Okay. No names. Shot to the head. Okay. I don't know what the entrance one. His room, I assume. I don't think anybody's in here. Shot wounds. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. I'll just have you walk out the front door. Going to 
ammo casings right here. Okay. We have confirmed all three. Yeah. His daughter in the back. Yeah. Officer Barber, I just want to ask some follow-up questions after reviewing State's Exhibit Number Four. Okay. Okay. First, why did you go approach and ring the doorbell? Uh, because the way the call was playing out, it sounded it was possibly what we call a swatting incident. We've had several in town over the years um, where someone calls in, like a, a home invasion or like a an active shooter kidnapping. To draw a big police response is like a way to harass somebody. So can you once again just explain to me what it, you mean by swatting situation? Uh, so they call in a situation that's serious enough that it would need like a SWAT response. That's why they call it swatting. And <clears throat> it appears that you were the last officer to enter into the home. Is, is that correct? Yes. And so when you entered into the home, was that what you were expecting to see? No. Why is that? Uh, because in route to the call, there was never a mention about um, a, a deceased person. So all we knew was that there was a male possibly shot in the foot. And were you giving some information that this was a, an actual burglary? Yeah, they, they sent a home invasion. They gave a description of a, a black male in dark clothing. And so we see you and officers do kind of a, like a little search or going through room to room. What are you doing there? Uh, we're doing it for safety to make sure there's no suspects in the house hiding. And then we're also looking for other possible victims. And how many other victims did you find? A total of three. You kind of just better lacking use some choice words at times throughout that video yes why were your, your demeanor those words coming out a little bit of frustration because of the way the call was coming out uh, we're getting very few details and it's one of those deals where it's either a super emergency with a high risk of danger or this is possibly a prank and so there's a little bit of frustration going back between the two and with regards to this possibly be a home invasion, did you see any signs of forced entry? No. Did you see any signs that it appeared someone had entered into the home? No. Did you see anything appear to be out of place? No, the house was very well kept. Did you see any furniture moved as there appeared to be any struggles anywhere? No. And you're not doing a thorough search that's not your job but you've been to other calls dealing with invasions before right yes and so when you do that is part of it is to try to take an initial look to see if there is anything that could be potential evidence to prove an invasion yes besides the back door that you entered was the front door locked or unlocked? It was locked. You saw that sectional area down in the basement. Did that appear to be moved at all? No. There was a coffee table with some puzzle pieces on it. Did you see any puzzle pieces on the ground? I guess I didn't look if they're on the ground, but nothing looked disturbed. Anything about the door that appeared to be broken or jammed with the basement door? No. <clears throat> what else did you do that day with regards to your, the investigation? Uh, once um, I exited the house, I uh, got with Officer Buckles and 
assisted him with his canine search. And after you assisted with the canine search, did you do anything else? Yeah, I found some construction workers um, in a... Ladies and gentlemen, um, this is one of those times where we're going to need to excuse you briefly um, and uh, take something up. So we're going to ask that uh, uh, I excuse you. I'd remind you of the admonition that I've given you previously. And, uh, you know, you can use the restroom. This isn't going to be, I don't anticipate a terribly long break, but uh, 10, 15 minutes, ask to be ready to go. Thank you. Seated, Officer Barber. You can. You don't need to stay. Stand oh, okay. During this. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Just to summarize, my understanding is um, there's going to be some testimony that uh, the state is going to be seeking some testimony from Officer Barber. Um, related to what uh, one or more of these construction workers said, uh, anticipating that uh, Mr. Johnson uh, is lodging a hearsay exception, I believe. But, um, you know, that's all I know at this point. So, Mr. Shear, why don't you tell me uh, what the anticipated testimony is? Uh, it, is it correct, Mr. Johnson, that your objection is hearsay? Correct. All right. Yes, Your Honor. And what the testimony that we are asking Officer Barber is regarding to after Officer Buckles and him did their canine search, Officer Barber's, Barber continued to walk down from the home, which is directly opposite of the 4414, to look for any signs of any indication of anybody leaving the residence. When doing so, he encountered two construction workers, which you can also hear their hammering from the Nest camera. He approached them and asked if there was anybody that came by and what time they had been there. The workers indicated that they were there in the early morning around 8 o'clock and that they observed nobody. Now, technically, by looking at that, that would be hearsay, but we're not necessarily using it for the truth of the matter, but rather for investigating purpose and their next step of responding. It has been attacked by Officer Buckle's testimony that they did not do a thorough search and that this suspect, allegedly suspect, either went one way or the other. And the way that Officer Barber, Barber goes is a direction where they have tried to make an argument that this person ran and that there was no investigation done to see if there was actually anybody that was there. This is just showing that the steps the officers did to try to see if they could locate any alleged suspect and shows their responsive conduct of also why they continue to only specific areas and cease searching any further down to that location. 
So yes, on its face it's hearsay, but it's not because it's not for the truth of the matter, but it's more showing just their responsive conduct and their next step in this investigation. Mr. Johnson, you want to sit down and use your mic? I understand. You, absolutely no problem with that, but uh, at least while we're arguing, if you want to use your mic, I'd appreciate it. Your Honor, this is totally being offered for the truth of the matter asserted. This, otherwise, it wouldn't be relevant. I often think, I often wonder why we put so much emphasis on why people did what they did. It doesn't matter. We expect officers to investigate the area. There's been no claim that they did otherwise. Um, I don't believe this is in a different direction than where, where the dog went. It's in the same general area as my understanding. But these are all things I could have tested with whatever witness they would have called. There is a, me a reference to a very specific individual. One of these Amish uh, workers is mentioned, and I think his phone number is in there. They could have called this person if they wanted to, and we have been able to test their, uh, uh, their attention to what they were doing versus looking around for anyone, and we're not allowed to do that if the court allows this hearsay evidence to come in. So we're objecting as to hearsay. All right. Anything further, Mr. Shear? Your Honor, I, I would say that it is relevant, once again, to continue to show the investigation done by the officers. Right. Right. Anything else, Mr. Shear? Anything else, Mr. Johnson? No, Your Honor. All right. Based on the record that's been made, uh, I do find that the, uh, uh, the anticipated testimony, as I understand it, uh, based on the record, is uh, not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted. Um, it's being used to explain the police conduct, the uh, next steps in the investigation. And so for that reason, uh, it is not uh, hearsay, and uh, uh, the objection is overruled. Any further record we need to make before proceeding with uh, the jury? No, Your Honor. Mr. Johnson? No, Your Honor. All right. Then I think that only took a few minutes. We gave the jury a little bit longer. Why don't we take a five-minute break um, and uh, be back ready to go in about five minutes. All right?
afraid if I yell into the mic, it's going to be. I would almost rather like talk out loud because I never know how loud to talk into these things.
All right, uh, thanks for your patience, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Officer Barber, um, I would just remind you, sir, that you are still under oath. Yes, sir. And with that, um, Mr. Shear, I believe you were still questioning Officer Barber, and you may resume. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Officer Barber, we kind of just left off that you had just got done helping Officer K-9, excuse me, Officer Buckles and his K-9 partner with a, a track. And I was asking him, what did you do next? Um, do you recall that? Yes. So after you assisted with the tracking, what did you do next in this investigation? I saw some construction workers um, up the hill. So I walked up to them and asked them if, how long they'd been here. Your Honor, once again, it's, it's a statement used to prove the response and investigation for this matter. It's not used for the truth of the matter. All right. For the reasons already stated, the objection is overruled. So once again, you approached these construction workers, and how far away were they from your path that you had walked from the, the 4414 residence? Not very far. I had to go up a hill a little bit. And there's another street behind the house that it was on. Uh, Your Honor, I could have shown for the jury the map that we had shown on Friday. Okay. Thank you. Your Honor, may I approach the screen? You may. And counsel, what I would say is that I think our discussion of the map um, – that occurred on Friday uh, is probably going to leave a poor record um, of, you know, what was uh, directions and whatnot. So uh, for record purposes, moving forward, perhaps you could do a uh, better job of identifying directions and streets and things like that. Okay. And I'm not singling you out. This was a, <laughs> a, a, a group issue.
why were you making your way or searching this area? Uh, just doing a general canvas of the area because that's the area where dispatch advised uh, the suspect ran. And were you trying to locate or find any evidence to find this alleged suspect? Yes, when the canine wasn't uh, picking up a track, um, I saw the workers, and so I, I basically asked them as witnesses whether or not they saw anybody run through here. And any evidence or any indication that anybody saw anybody running through this area? Uh, no, they, they said they'd been there since 8 in the morning and that they had not seen anybody run through there. Officer Buckles, after you did this initial search, did you do anything else with the investigation on this case? No. Do you see the individual that was assisted out of the home in the courtroom today? Yes. And do you know what that individual's name is? Alex Jackson. And could you please just point to Mr. Jackson and describe the color of shirt and coat that he's wearing today? Uh, he's wearing a black coat, white shirt, no tie. Thank you. Your Honor, may the record reflect the witness has identified the defendant? The record so reflects. Thank you, Your Honor. And did all of these events occur within Lynn County? Yes. Thank you, Officer Bar Barber. No further questions at this time, Your Honor. Mr. Johnson, cross-examination. Hi. Yes, we use the information dispatch gives us to the call. In other words, you're not sitting there actively listening to the caller and what the caller said. No. So you would be surprised then to learn that in the call to the dispatch, the word burglary was never mentioned once. Would you be surprised to hear that? No. Okay. So you're not claiming that you were responding to a burglary, are you? I believe the wording they use is a home invasion. I took it as meaning the same thing, a home invasion. And also, would you be surprised to learn that the person who called said that they'd been shot and that their dad had been shot? We were not given that information, though. Okay. So when you told Mr. Shear on direct examination that this is not what you were expecting when you saw the scene, it's because you hadn't been told everything that dispatch had been told. Would that be fair to say? Yes. Approximately, yeah. And when you went into the house, according to your video, it was 8.36 by the time you got in. Would that be fair? Yes. Okay. And there's nothing about your video that is inaccurate, right? No. Okay. I want to ask you a few questions about what you encountered when you got to that neighborhood. Do you understand what I'm asking? Not yet. <laughs> Okay. Uh, the Oak Leaf Court area is a relatively secluded neighborhood. Would you agree to that? Yes. And somewhat affluent? Yes. In other words, it's a richer or more expensive area of town than a lot of the areas that you encounter. Yes. And 4414 would be all the way back at the end of the cul de sac, is that right? Correct. Yes. The back behind there is a, a wood, right? There's a, there's a wood behind that house. It's been a while. I don't remember how big the woods in the area there is. Check the bail on the see if that picture back up. Thank you. I'm going to try to indicate to you. Can you see that okay, officer? Yes. So behind uh, the house that we're talking about, uh, all these there's all these woods right here, right? Yes. And uh, this is the house right here that's 4414. 
Yes. And so there's all these woods in this area here, correct? Yes. And then there's Cosmic Ferry Road. I'm indicating to the top of the diagram here. It's behind that, correct? It is. And the uh, construction workers that you encountered, you've already testified, were over here behind the house further up on the right-hand side of the diagram at the top. They were behind that house, right? Uh, a couple of them were behind it. One was more on the corner. On the corner right here? Yes. Okay. And they're working on something behind that house? Yes. I, I think, I'm oh, sorry. I think in general they're just doing siding work, so they're probably working around the house. Okay. Working on the house? Yes. So when you're doing that kind of work, you've got your back to everything going on. You're, you're working on the house, right? The first guy I encountered was, and he was on a, uh, like a bench facing towards me when I walked up to him. But you don't know what he was doing before you got there? No. Okay. Now, over here, if we go back to Scarlet Lake Court, which is the street that runs to the south, this is north. Is this, is this north? I believe so, yeah. Yes. And there's woods over here as well, correct? Yes. Just and tree, if yeah. you were to go through those woods, it would empty out onto 42nd Street? Uh, no, I, 42nd know? Street's a little further down. Uh, if you keep going south, 42nd Street's uh, east-west road. Okay, so would it be down here then? It'd be further down, yeah. At the bottom of the... Yeah, it's not on the map. Okay, right. So what's, what street would be over here then, going along this way? I don't know. To be honest, this was the first time I'd ever been in that neighborhood since I've worked for the department. Sure. When you arrived at... Thank you. Thank you for that. then there were no cars in the driveway, right? No. And I'm talking about 4414, right? I didn't see any cars, no. To the outward observer, the house looked like it might be uninhabited, right? Well, I don't know about it, uninhabited. Well, I mean, there weren't I mean, any cars outside. Yeah, there's no, I'm, just because there's no cars doesn't mean no one's there. No, I understand, but there wasn't any evidence on the outside of the house that anybody was inside the house, was there? I, I wouldn't use that as the only evidence, I guess. What other evidence would you consider? Knocking on the door and seeing if anyone's home. And when you did that? No one. Okay. Did you also notice that there was a dog in the screened-in porch? Later on in the call, yeah. And the dog wasn't barking when you got there, was it? No. In fact, you can't hear any dog barking on your video at all. No. I know that when police come to our house or anybody comes to our house, my dogs go crazy. Did you hear any dogs bark, any, that dog barking once the whole time the police were there? No. When everybody uh, entered, and when I mean everybody, all of the police officers, were any of them wearing those footies that you can wear so you don't disturb the crime scene? No. And that's because that wasn't your top priority, right? No. You weren't there to investigate the crime scene. You were there to render aid to whoever might need it. Yes. And to make sure that you were safe. Yes. You were in that house then for 10 minutes? Approximately. And in that 10 minutes, you were responsible for securing that residence, right? Yes. And making sure that you had the backs of your fellow officers. Yes. Thank you. I don't have any further questions. Any redirect examination, Mr. Shear? Officer Barber, did you ever see any evidence of a home invasion? No. Thank you. Mr. Johnson, anything further? 
Nothing further, Your Honor. All right. Officer Barber, uh, thank you. You may step down and you are excused. Just by who's got the microphone, I'm assuming you're up now, Ms. Slaughter? I am, Your Honor. All right. Ms. Slaughter, does the state have uh, another witness to call this morning? State calls Tim Brown. All right. <clears throat> morning. Mr. Brown, I presume, I'm going to have you come on up over here to the chair on my far left, if you would. And you can go ahead and have, go ahead and have a seat when you get there. And then, Mr. Brown, that microphone is live. You can slide it back and forth, move it up and down however you'd like. Okay. Uh, first thing I'm going to do, sir, is swear you in. If you please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you'll be giving this morning will be the truth? I do. All right. And uh, then just for the record, can you please provide us with your first and last name and spell them both? Timothy Brown, T-I-M-O-T-H-Y-B-R-O-W-N. All right. Mr. Shear, or to me, Ms. Slaughter. Officer Brown, can you tell us how you're employed? I'm employed by the police department of the city of Cedar Rapids. And how long have you been employed as a police officer for Cedar Rapids? About six and a half years. Did you have any law enforcement experience prior to your employment with CRPD? I did not. Did you graduate from one of the law enforcement academies in Iowa? Yes, I did. And which one was that? Uh, the Cedar Rapids Regional in 2016. Can you tell us approximately when you went through the Law Enforcement Academy, how long, um, how long that academy lasted? I think it was around five or six months, the actual academy process was. And what's your current title with CRPD? I am a patrol officer. Have you, from the time that you joined CRPD, maintained the title of patrol officer? Yes. And can you tell us essentially what is a patrol officer? Uh, I work the day shift responding to calls for service. Um, I also serve as a member of the uh, special response team, and I'm also a field training officer. Okay, let's break some of that down. Uh, day shift, when you say day shift, what hours are you assigned to work? I work 7 in the morning till 5 p.m. And during that seven to five shift, are you assigned any specific beat? I typically work the central beat, which is mostly uh, downtown. And when I say beat, can you tell us what I mean when I say beat? It's a general geographical area. Um, I would say it's roughly uh, 20 blocks either direction from um, the police department. Officer Brown, you also said that you are a field training officer, correct? Yes, ma'am. Can you first tell us what it means to be a field training officer? Uh, when the department is looking for officers to um, train recruits that are coming out of the academy, uh, officers can apply for those jobs um, and be assigned a recruit uh, for typically a month-long period uh, when they leave the academy to teach them paperwork, uh, calls for service, uh, just general mentorship. So, just to be clear, you go through the academy, is that book training and um, practical training? Yes. Okay. After the academy, are you just thrown onto the street, here's a car, here's a gun, ready to go? No, that's when you're assigned a field training officer to help guide you over the next uh, four to five months. And you are one of those field training officers. Yes, ma'am. Is that something that you apply for, or are you selected, or both? Uh, you put in for it. There's an interview process, and um, uh, if you are selected, then you can get that title. And how long have you been a field training officer? About two or three years. 
You also said that you are a member of the special response team. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And is that abbreviated or shortened to be SRT? Yes. Tell us what a special response team is. Um, some people know it better as the SWAT team, uh, responding to high-risk calls for service, uh, serving high-risk search warrants. How do you become a member of that team? Uh, that is also a application process uh, followed by uh, physical fitness tests, interviews with the team members, and interviews with uh, command and staff. Once you're selected for both the FTO program or the SRT team, do you receive additional training? Through SRT, we typically train about twice a month. Um, FTOs, uh, we usually once a year have a uh, few hours course um, going through just general updates and the academy process, changes in paperwork and things like that. Officer Brown, in June of 2021, were you employed with CRPD? Yes. At that time, were you already a member of the SRT team? Yes. And were you a field training officer then as well? I think I was at that time. In June of 2021, did you still work the day shift? Yes. And were you still assigned primarily to the central beat that covers the downtown area? Yes. Were you a solo or a partnered unit in June of 2021? I was a solo unit that day. And when I ask solo, does that mean that you're just, you're in your patrol vehicle alone? Yes. I want to draw your attention specifically to June 15th of 2021. Were you on duty that morning? Yes, ma'am. And did you become involved in an investigation being called out for the address 4414 Oak Leaf Court Northeast? I was. Is that in Cedar Rapids? Yes. Is that in Lynn County? Yes. How did you come to be involved in that uh, call for service if that's not a part of your regular uh, beat that you work? Um, that early in the morning, there are usually not as many officers working. Uh, the next shift typically comes on at 11. Um, on that day, I was responding to a separate uh, alarm call, and I was in the northeast area. Uh, I was diverted from that and dispatched to Oak Leaf Court. And to be dispatched to Oak Leaf Court, what information did you receive from the dispatcher that sent you in that direction? Uh, dispatch didn't have much information uh, when I was sent. Um, it was reported that uh, there had been a break-in. There was a male who was shot, um, and he was bleeding. Throughout the call, did you continue to get updated information from dispatch? Most of the updated information I got was when I got closer. Um, I was asking dispatch for more information. I think at the time they were speaking with him and attempting to do so. Um, but when I arrived on scene, I there was still limited information. Uh, it was believed that the back door to the residence was open and that the uh, offender had fled. When you got in the neighborhood of the Oak Leaf Court address, where did you park? I was uh, a few houses uh, down from 4414. Um, I initially was a little closer, uh, but as I got there, I realized the residence, uh, the back of it was wooded. Uh, I had some concern um, that if a suspect was back there, and I think at that point they had mentioned a long gun, um, so I backed up a little further. When you say they had mentioned a long gun, are you referring to dispatch? Dispatch, I'm sorry. May I approach the witness, Your Honor?
Mr. Brown, are you familiar with the neighborhood that's depicted in the map that's up on the screens? Uh, yes, I haven't looked at it in a while, though. Do you need a second to familiarize yourself? Uh, no, I believe I can see. In this map, can you identify the house 4414 uh, Oak Leaf Court? I believe it is, I'm sorry, uh, that one right there. And can you give us a general idea of where you parked your vehicle when you arrived uh, in the neighborhood? Uh, initially, I was in front of this residence, and I backed up a little bit further uh, to around there. So just to make the record clear, um, it appeared that you pointed in front of the house that would be directly south of the 4414 um, across Oak Leaf excuse me, across Scarlet Oak Court Northeast, is that correct? Yes. And then when you backed up your patrol vehicle, it appeared that you pointed to what would be the second house south of the 4414 Oak Leaf Court, is that correct? Yes. Once you got your patrol vehicle parked, tell us what you did next, officer. Um, I parked my vehicle. I was still waiting on more units to arrive due to the lack of information. Um, I wasn't going to run into the residence with what little we had provided. Um, due to the distance I was away, I uh, retrieved my patrol rifle uh, from the trunk of my squad car, and I just maintained a position where I could see the residence until I was joined by other officers. And what other officers joined you? Officer Buckles and Officer Barber. Tell us what happens when Officer Buckles and Officer Barber showed up. Um, we had a brief conversation. Um, I think we were all uh, a little reluctant to believe all the details, our lack of details. Um, at that time, I think there began to be information that family was in the residence. Um, I did request uh, at some point that dispatch have one of them come out or get onto the phone. And one, when you say one of them, you mean one of the family members? Yes, I was being told by dispatch that family of some sort was inside the residence, and um, the caller was unable to get out on his own. Um, I was requesting that they have him exit and meet me in the driveway or outside the residence um, when that wasn't a possibility and I learned that there was possibly family in the residence I requested that one of them either get on the phone or come out and meet me and still we were being told for whatever reason it wasn't possible um, did you and officer buckles and officer barber then decide to make an approach to the residence yes we I went towards the back of the residence with Officer Buckles. Uh, he um, collected his canine partner at that time. Uh, Officer Barber went to the front of the residence. Um, as we were approaching, we were still being very cautious. Um, it was very quiet in the neighborhood. There was nobody that I can recall out and about. I don't even remember any traffic. Um, so we approached slowly, getting as much information from dispatch as we could. When you approached the rear of the home, did you make any observations about the entry exit point to the rear of the home? So it was reported that the back door was open. Uh, when I got closer, I could see that um, this had a walkout basement. Um, we got to the corner of the residence, and I wanted to get a better view on the backside of the house before we went walking in front of windows. Um, it was at that point that I uh, left Officer Buckles and peeled around uh, to a wood line that was in the back of the residence. There was a little gravel pathway, um, and I found cover uh, behind a tree uh, that overlooked the back of the residence. Why was the fact that there were several windows on the back side of that house worrisome to you? If, in fact, uh, there had been an intruder that was still inside, um, 
we still were not confident that anything at all was happening. Um, I was concerned maybe this was a false report, uh, like a swatting call, and we didn't want to just be barging into a random person's house or be spooking random people. So after you take cover or take up a position in the wood line, as you referred to it, what happens next? That's when I finally saw something that made sense, which was the back door was in fact open. And I think that was the uh, point that I relayed that to other officers and we started, I'm sorry, they started to approach the door um, because I, I guess, like I said, at that point, that was the only thing that had finally lined up to me. And when those other officers began to approach the door, did you follow them to the residence? Yes, I heard them calling out to a subject and it sounded like they were talking to somebody. Um, when I saw them make entry, I ran from my location and proceeded in the residence as well. Tell us what you saw when you first entered the home. Um, there was a male laying face down um, near a couch. Uh, Officer Buckles was uh, making contact with him and we quickly discovered that he was uh, deceased with a gunshot wound to his head and um, we could hear somebody calling out from the hallway and when we went a little deeper into the living room we could uh, see uh, Alexander down the hallway. And you named the person as Alexander, would that be Alexander Jackson? Yes. And when you say you saw Alexander, was he the person alive that was in the hallway? Yes. Is that person in the courtroom today? He is. And can you point him out, describe him to us? He is wearing the uh, white shirt, black suit coat, and a goatee. With no tie? Correct. Your Honor, if the record could reflect that this witness has identified <clears throat> the defendant. The record so reflects. Once you um, are in the residence, Officer Brown, uh, see the defendant in the hallway, what do you do next? I, at that point, notified dispatch that we had uh, more than one victim. Um, we didn't know at that point that there were any more than one. Um, and we began to secure the residence, uh, making sure that nobody was inside and the scene was gonna be safe uh, to start having medical personnel come on scene. At that point, when you notified dispatch that there was more than one victim, by victim, did you mean more than one person who was wounded? Yes. And at that point, the two people that you were aware that were wounded were who? Uh, it was uh, the father and Alexander at that time. When you started to secure the residence, um, were you checking back rooms? Yes, there was a number of storage rooms uh, and bedrooms in the basement. And we went through those just to make sure there was nobody else inside. Once you secured those additional rooms, what happened next? Um, Officer Kaczynski uh, went to check one of the back bedrooms. Uh, at that time, he called out that there was a third victim. And that back bedroom would be still in that lower level? Yes. After you found out that there was a third victim on scene, what did you do next? Uh, I helped Officer Kaczynski finish up in that back area of the um, basement, and then we still needed to uh, proceed to the upstairs to make sure that was secure as well. And did officers go to the main level? Yes. Were you one of the officers who went up there? I was. Once you and other officers got to the main level, did a protective sweep uh, ensue up there as well? Yes. Tell us what happens when you get to that uh, main level or top floor of the house. Uh, I got to an open area at the top of the stairs. Um, I proceeded to a section that I was told was not cleared yet. Um, I checked some closets and an office and a bathroom area. Uh, at some point, um, another officer located uh, a fourth victim. 
Where was that fourth victim located? I believe it was the master bedroom. I didn't make it into that room. Officer Brown, there was a point where your business, for lack of a better word, was completed on the main level of the home. Is that correct? Yes. And did you return to the basement level? Yes, I did. Um, what happens when you return to the basement level? Um, we realized that all of us had accidentally proceeded upstairs and nobody was downstairs with Alexander anymore. Um, he had crawled down the hallway towards um, where the rifle and his father were laying. Um, so I stopped at the bottom of the stairs, waited with him, and asked him his name. Um, and tried to ask him what happened. When you got back down to the bottom of the stairs and made contact with the defendant, was he fiddling with something? He was playing with a 22 round. I don't recall if it was a spent casing or a unspent. And when you observed him fiddling with that casing, what did you do? I asked for him to put it down. And did he? Yes. During your interaction with the defendant, did you ask him what happened? I did. And did you get a response? Uh, he just told me that there was a man. By this time, did medical personnel arrive on scene? Uh, yes, they had arrived and were near the back of the residence. Once the ambulance personnel or the EMTs arrived on scene, what did you do next? Uh, we didn't want to let have all the uh, paramedics and firefighters come inside and contaminate the scene, so we assisted him to his feet, uh, him being Alexander to his feet, and walked him to the back door. Is that where he then was seated on a stretcher? Yes. Officer Brown, was the defendant transported to the hospital? Yes. And was that done by ambulance? Yes. Was there a decision made that you would accompany the defendant in the ambulance during that transport? Yes. Whose decision was that? Um, Sergeant Hansen requested that I ride. Um, when I got to the uh, ambulance itself, one of the paramedics asked if I was riding, and I said I would. Prior to the defendant being loaded into the ambulance, did you conduct a pat-down search of the defendant? Yes. I saw that he was wearing, like, gym shorts or something, and we just briefly checked what little pockets he had. Is that routine or typical um, in a case of a gunshot to pat down um, the patient being transported to the hospital? Yes. Why? Just to make sure there's no weapons um, or anything that could be dangerous to uh, paramedics, even on routine medical calls uh, with individuals. We make sure that there's nothing in their pockets and there's, uh, if they have backpacks, we typically ask if we can go through those so paramedics are comfortable transporting. Officer Brown, what you're wearing today, is that a, um, is that your assigned patrol uniform? Yes. And as part of your patrol uniform, are you equipped with a body camera? Yes. And are you wearing that body camera today? I am. Would you mind standing up and showing the jury where your body cam is affixed? Uh, right here. Is that where your body cam was affixed back in June of 2021? I believe it was. In June of 2021, Officer Brown, um, was your body camera functional? Yes. And did it record your... Did it record you? <laughs> yes. Um, on the day of June 15th of 2021? Yes and your interactions with the defendant? Yes. And did it record your interactions with the defendant while he was in the ambulance being transported to the hospital? Yes. And did you have an opportunity, Officer Brown, to review the recording from your body camera prior to coming into court today? 
Yes. And what was depicted in that recording, did that fairly and accurately depict your interactions? Yes. Your Honor, at this time, the state would move to have Exhibit 5 admitted <coughs> into evidence. Any objection? No, Your Honor. All right, State's Exhibit 5 is admitted. At this time, Your Honor, the state would ask to publish State's Exhibit 5. And that's fine. We can do that just roughly. How long is this, Ms. Slaughter? The recording in State's Exhibit 5 um, that we are planning to play right now, Your Honor, is approximately 40 minutes. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, just for scheduling purposes, we took a break. I wasn't planning on us taking another one uh, before we adjourned over the noon hour. That being said, as I've indicated before, I don't, you know, not here to make anybody uncomfortable. So um, we'll play with plan, plan with uh, uh, plan on playing the video. But if anybody at any point thinks we need a break, just raise your hand, and we can certainly do that. Okay. All right. Right, but this sounds fucked. If there's people in the house, there's no reason they can't come out. This is sounding like... All right, well, I'm going to go around to the back. I'm going to see if I can get eyes. All right. I'm going to go around the side here. Try to get one of them on the line and get somebody to come outside. So it should be this one, right? Well, the thing was there was a court in this court. Yeah. But it did show the far dead end. Good. But it's the one on the corner. dog on the back porch. Forty four fourteen. Is that right? Forty four fourteen is supposed to be the house number, correct? All right, we're on the back side. It looks like there's uh, egress from the basement, so we'll try to get eyes on that here. He said he rung the doorbell. any open doors back here. Yeah, I don't really want to be in front of the window if this is uh, been front. Tell you what, hold right here. I'm going to go long. I'm going to get behind that tree. I'm going to get a look on the back side. I still think something's fucked with this.
the back door is open. <clears throat> the back door right at the end of the landing is open. All the shades are drawn so I can't really see anything. Looks like the uh, window to the right of the door is open, but there's a glare. Shot wound to the head. The other is uh, wounded in the leg. Start another 52. Justin, have him come on scene. Corey, you and Justin, do upstairs. Kurt, you want to go upstairs with them? Tim, you want to knock one with your foot? Yeah. This all needs to be cleared out, though. we got a door here. Who's this down here? You are your dad. Is that your dad? What happened? What happened? Who shot your dad? Is she, is she okay? Is that a room right there? Sabrina! You already got this behind us? I didn't. I got that. Let's just, well, it's a deep laundry room. Let me go check. Cedar Rabbits, please! Hey, friendly. I didn't realize it connected. Third victim? Yeah. Fuck. Two, three. Yeah. You're good there. 115, we have three victims. Start us at least three ambulances. Who's with me? I'm coming with you, Barbara. Barbara, come this way. You come in front of me, yep. Barbara? You yep. got... All right. Alan, you go help All right, I'm coming. Where you at? What the fuck? Closet. Blocked from the outside. I think it's going to be fine. Just stay where you are, man. Alright, we're coming up to you. Sound off now! Let me, get this, apartment. let me get this closet quick. Okay, I'm gonna go in here. Looks like a master bedroom. Fourth victim. Fuck! Hey, I'm on the other side. I think this door connects.
I think this door might connect, so I'm going to open it just so you guys know. All right. Yeah. Sarah PD. Bradley. All right. Yeah, it connects to this office. Yep. Coming across. Hey. You good? <sighs> you got that closet. I thought one. Hey, hey stop hey. moving! Yeah, I'll get him out. Yep. All right. Are you able to walk or limp? You want to get fired? Go out to the road, get medical to come in through the basement. What's your name? Huh? What's your name? Alex. Alex. Yeah. Alex, what happened? There, there was a man. What man? A, a tall man. Okay. How old are you? Twenty. Hey, lift that low. Leave it right there. Breathe and relax, all right? You should get my mom. Yep, we're getting everybody. You're Alex, right? Yeah. Okay, Alex. I want you to relax and worry about yourself right now. Okay. Help him out. Okay. He was playing with a round, so... <laughs> that one right there. Okay. Trying to keep him from moving. We're going to help you out. I'm going to put on gloves real quick. Thank you. And then we're going to go to the uh, back porch. I think he's in shock about everything. Mm -hmm. You're right for my car right now. Since I'm parked closest. In the yeah. Okay, what's your name? Um, I got mine if you want it. Right. Just hang on up there, and we'll bring him out. We're going to bring him out. Dad's down with a gunshot wound to the head. Okay. There's a female DOA in the bedroom over there. Okay. Mom's DOA upstairs. Okay. Uh, I believe this is a son who was hit in the foot. Okay. We are not sure we have what hit. No idea. There is a rifle on the ground here. Do you want to go in with one of us? Just partner, to look you got to go in and do the DOAs. Okay. Comment, okay, perfect. <laughs> but if you guys just want to do your stuff out here with him. Okay. It's, it's, hey, hey, okay. someone help. Okay. So a, just stand up. They're going to have you sit on that cot as soon as they get it lowered, okay? Looks to be a 22. Well, the rounds on the floor are 22s, okay. so... Yeah, cancel everybody else and you want to do the DOAs and yeah. Can you scoot that over here? Come bring it on. Yeah, can you bring it over here? Actually, have him sit on here. There you go. Have a seat. Your name is Yeah. Um, yeah you want me to go with him? Yeah. Yeah, if you want to. Or okay. bring your car up, either one. Well, I'll follow them. Court, you want to go to this half and call 911 right away, bud? Yeah. Or one of the ones, the two of you. Actually, if you have a foot up there for me. Or if you want to go grab your car. Yeah, I'll follow. Okay. I tried asking him. He didn't. Yeah. He just said there's a man and that's all the further we got. Do you guys have cameras here at your house? Uh, yeah. One in the front. Okay. One in the front. Anything inside or anything? 
Do you need to yeah, stick with him? I don't, I don't know. Why don't you get your car up here so that we're... <coughs> hey, or let them know it's possible that he's... Hey, Jesse, you want to double check his pockets before? I, I did while we were down there real quick, but... You have to have anything in there? Nothing on you you're not supposed to have? I hope not. Okay. We just want to make sure that everybody's safe. Got a lot of pockets. There's a, I just want to... hey, there's a possibility that... I... Alright, I'm gonna go with Ari and just stick with him until the investigator gets there. Are you gonna... I'll try to get some... Are you gonna ride in with him? Do you want me to? I it, will. Yeah, it probably wouldn't hurt. Okay. You guys hear anything? Did you guys hear any shots? Fine now. I'll be riding with the area with the uh, 20 year old. What's your first name as it appears on your ID? Uh, Alexander? It's Alexander. Can you spell Alexander for me? A-L-E-X-A-N-D-E-R. Alexander, what's your last name? Jackson. Jackson? Yeah, they didn't write it down. They got it. Alexander, what's your birthday? September 20th. Of what year? 2000. Sorry, man. We're, we're doing a lot of stuff here, so I apologize. Dude. Anyone run his info yet? I don't think so yet. I got it right now. I'll do it on three. Alexander Jackson, yeah. 
115 on three, 29 for the 20 year old male. Understandable, you know, sometimes you might pull full on something and not realize that there's another wound somewhere. You can see that one, you can't see the one in your back. There, so just make sure, okay? One fifteen on three, twenty nine. Last name Jackson, John, Adam, Charles, King, Sam, Ocean, Nora, first name Alexander, Adam, Lincoln, Edward, X-Ray, Adam, Nora, David, Edward, Robert. It was uh, 2000, 09, 20, 2000, 20, the individual transporting to the hospital. Thank you. Yeah. 
Yes, I think there should be. this one. That's it, it's okay. Real beauty. Any more than just the 22? Uh, we got a locker full of them. A locker full of them, gotcha. But it's locked, so. Well, that's good. We lost the keys, so. Oh, no. Did you lose the key? It's like a year ago, almost. A long time ago. Investigator Lucina. Yes, ma'am. Uh, investigator Denlinger. Yes, ma'am. I've been this close. Area was chatting with everyone I was. But it's all. Yes. Yes. You guys got a bag? If you want it. If you want it. I think he was using it for pressure, maybe. Or I'm not. I don't know. Yeah, he's got nothing on him. Yeah, he's got no firearms. Good morning. Hi. This is Alex. 
pounds. Okay. Uh, you can kind of see what we're here for. Yep. Um, looks like they're going through to me. It looks like there's a hole on the bottom there. You just want to stand up here and kind of tell. Um, so yeah. Yeah. You, you should be able to put count. this in there. Well. Yeah. And you put it on top of that. Yeah, right yeah. Let's clip it onto Brandon or something. Yeah, I don't have a clip. Once the basket weave thing. Oh, sweet. Just slide in here. Yeah. 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 Purposes, Your Honor, the state has stopped the video at 40 minutes 35 seconds into the video. Actual time on the video stamp: nine minutes 11 seconds 36. Excuse me, 9 a.m. 11 minutes 36 seconds. All right, and is that it for the video for the time being? Yes, Judge. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you good to keep going? Okay, uh, that was a. Uh, we can sit in our seats. Why don't we just in your seat? Everybody stand up, and we'll take a quick stretch. Everybody have a seat, and uh, Ms. Slaughter, you may uh, resume your examination. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Officer Brown, when you met up with or were, when you were met by Investigator Denlinger and Investigator Lucina at the hospital, were they equipped with a body camera? Uh, no. Is that typical for investigators that they're not wearing body cameras? They typically do not. You provided someone with your body camera, is that correct? Yes. Who was the person that you handed that to or that took that off of your vest? It was Investigator Bosenberg. Did your body cam remain with Investigator Denlinger and Lucina in the defendant's hospital room? for the duration that they were there? Yes. And just to be clear, their interaction with the defendant while he was in the hospital uh, room, was that captured in this same video clip? Yes. I don't have any further questions for this witness, Your Honor. Mr. Johnson, cross-examination. Thank you. Mr. You might turn on that microphone, sorry. I was having some trouble hearing a lot of that. I don't know if anybody else was. Maybe it's just my age. So I'd like to go over some of that with you, if that's all right. Okay. Could you hear it okay? Uh, most of the video, yes. All right. Um, at 8.32 and 42 seconds, you remarked there's a big dog on the back porch. You remember that part? Yes, when approaching the house. And that dog was not barking, was it? I don't recall if it was or not. Okay. Well, sitting there today, do you remember hearing any barking at all? No. And did you hear any barking on your body cam? Uh, I don't recall hearing barking. And at 8.34.44, you remark that the back door is open. The back door right at the end of the landing is open, right? Yes. And then uh, there's a conversation when you get inside. Uh, one of the officers says, who's this down here? 
and Alexander Jackson says, my dad, right? Yes. And you said, what happened? And he said something that's hard to hear, and he said, there was a man. You remember that? I remember him saying something about there was a man at that point, yes. And then somebody asks at 837, who else is here? And Alex says, my sister, right? Uh, I don't remember if I heard that or not at the time. But it, it's on your body cam, right? Uh, it should be if it picked it up. And he says, she's in her room. He being Alex says, she's in her room. And you said, is she okay? And he said, I, I think so. Right? I think so, yes. And then there's uh, some yelling that goes on at 840. Um, and somebody yells at Mr. Jackson, hey, no, hey, hey, stop moving. Remember that part? Uh, yes. Because originally when you came in, Alex was way down the end of the hall in front of his room. Would that be fair to say? Yes. And then when we see him again in the video, he's very up, much up close with his father. Is that right? Yes, he crawled towards his father. And then at the... Uh, 841 7 mark you ask him what his name is and he says huh like h-u-h question mark like huh right uh i thought when i asked him what his name was he told me it was alex okay. well that was my next my next question but then you said what's your name and he says alex right yes he told me his name was alex and you said alex what happened he said there was a man you said what man and he said a tall man yes at 841.54, Alex says, did you get my mom? You remember that? Yes. And you said, yeah, we are getting everybody. You're, you're, all, you're all right, Alex? And he says, yeah. You remember that? I said, you're Alex, right? Oh, got that backwards. So you, Okay. So you said, you're Alex, right? Yes. And then you said, okay, Alex, I want you to relax and worry about yourself right now. Yes. And he said, okay. And then at 8.42.11, we hear an officer say, I think he's in shock about all this. I think he's in shock about everything. Was that you or a different officer? That was me. At 8.44, an officer asks Alex, how long ago did this happen? Did you call 911 right away, bud? And Alex said, yeah. Right? I believe so, but I don't think I asked that question. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure that you did either, but it is on your body cam. Right? I think so, yes. And then somebody asked him, do you guys have cameras here at your house? And Alex says, uh, yeah, one in the front. Remember that? Yes. And that's when he's outside on the gurney. Yes. At 848.34... The male paramedic that we see a lot in this video. Do you know what his name was? I don't know his name. Okay. okay. He says, okay, what number would you give the pain? Ten being the worst pain you've ever felt in your life and zero being none at all. And Alex said probably a ten. Right? Correct. At 8.50 and 31, the male paramedic is having a conversation with Alex in the ambulance, right? Mm-hmm. Is that, I'm sorry, is that a yes? Yes. And he wants, he's asking Alex what happened. Correct. And Alex says, uh, so he said, well, the paramedic says, so it's 8.50, what time do you think you got shot? And Alex says, uh, and then I couldn't make that out. Do you know what he said there? I couldn't make out what he said either. And the male paramedic says, were you sleeping when this happened? What happened? And Alex said, I was sleeping on the porch. Remember that? Yes. And he said, male paramedic said, you were sleeping on the porch? And he goes, yes, my dog, where's my dog? Remember that? He's asking. I do. And the male paramedic says, dog's on the porch. Black dog, question mark. Remember that? I remember them talking about the dog, yes. At what point on this ambulance ride did you observe them giving Mr. Jackson his fentanyl dose? I don't know what the fentanyl dose looks like. Okay. So... If that was given to him through an IV, it would have been around the time they were setting up the IV, do you think? I don't know what the fentanyl dose or what the treatments they were doing were. 
So you don't know that fentanyl is an anesthetic? I don't know what they were treating him with. I was not tending to him in that manner. But you do know that he was given a dose of fentanyl on the ambulance ride. You do know that. I didn't know he was given fentanyl. But there is a discussion about that when you get to the hospital. There's a discussion that you were, that your body cam film where he's talking about that he got 100 of fentanyl. I don't remember talking about fentanyl. Okay. And then at 851.31, Alex uh, is talking to the male paramedics, and uh, they're, at, again, talking about what happened. And Alex says, I ran into him. And the male paramedic says, what's that, Alex? I'm sorry. Alex says, I ran into him. You, you ran into who, says the male paramedic, paramedic. And Alex says, the man. Right? Something like that, yes. And at 852.39, the male paramedic says, okay, you ran into him how? I hit him and I, and the guy, and male paramedic says, with like a fist or uh, kind of, I just charged, then he got my foot, right? Yeah, he said something about he got his foot and was chuckling at that time. And it was hard to hear, but Alex does cry while he's in the ambulance, right? Uh, quietly and briefly, yes. Alex was crying when he was in the ambulance, correct? Quietly and briefly, yes. I think the jury could determine the length of time, don't you think? Okay. And again, you don't know at what point he had received the fentanyl, do I you? do not. And you know that he had a bullet wound to his foot? Yes. And you do know that people react differently when they're in shock? I do. And that they react differently when they've been, when they receive something like fentanyl? I don't know how everybody would react to fentanyl. describes hearing gunshots to the male paramedic, doesn't he? I believe so. And, that they, and then he saw somebody in the house, right? Yes. At 8.56 and 34, Alex asks, is my sister okay? You heard him ask that, right? Uh, yes, I believe so. And nobody tells him whether she's okay or not, do they? No. At 8.59 and 45, Alex asked, did they get an ambulance for my dad? Correct. This was after he was crying. I don't remember if that was before or after. Well, at 8.59, Alex can be seen crying, right? I don't have the timestamp written down in front of me. And then, as he's crying, he says, did they get an ambulance for my dad? I remember him asking that question. He asked it twice, right? Then right again, he said, did you get an ambulance for my dad? Right? I don't remember how many times he asked that. Okay. And the male paramedic answers, there's somebody there. Right? I don't remember what the paramedic said. That was a conversation between them. And then the male par and then Alex says, I hope they find, do you know what he said after that? When he started off, I hope they find do you have in your notes what was said there at that time? I don't remember him saying anything along those lines. The male paramedic answers, well, that I can't tell you. I wasn't there. There was somebody else there. I don't know about your mom or your sister or your dad, okay? And Alex says, okay. Do you, you remember that conversation? I don't know if I could ever make out those words or if I ever did when I was reviewing the camera. Do you, do, you don't think that conversation occurred? I don't recall hearing it that way, no. And then the male paramedic asks Alex about his dad, right? I don't remember at one point they were asking about the dad, but he did ask about his dad at some point. No, I'm not asking at what point, but you remember him saying, you remember the male paramedic asked Alex about his dad? I remember the male paramedic was asking uh, what his father did. Well, Alex told him what his father did, right? Yes. He told him it was computers. Something right? along those lines, yes. He designed IT, right? I don't recall exactly what they were talking about. Alex's first response was that his dad was retired. Remember that part? I don't remember their entire conversation. 
and a male paramedic asked about his mother and your mom, and he said she was a photographer. Yeah, like professional. She's really good. Yes, they talked about photography. But that's what Alex said. About his mother, yes. The male paramedic asked Alex, what time did you go to bed last night? And Alex said 11. Remember that part? I don't remember that part of their conversation. And the male paramedic said, 11, okay, did you sleep on the patio all night? And Alex responded, yeah, it's nice out there. Remember that part? I remember that. All right. And then when you hand off Alex out of the ambulance, and we see investigator Lacina and investigator Denlinger there, you say to them, he's not there right now. I said something along those lines, yes. Meaning he's out of it. What's that? Meaning that he's out of it, right? Something along those lines, yes. And Sarah Lacina, investigator Lacina says, yeah, I can tell. I don't remember her reply. I expect this part to be played, and I'm not suggesting anything from the prosecution. I know they stopped because this was your involvement, your immediate involvement. But the male paramedic says at nine, a little later after 9-11, 27, vitals have been all stable. I gave him 100 of fentanyl. Um, he's got an 18 in that left AC if you need it. Remember that? I don't know what any of that means. Hearing that, um, that's outside the scope of this witness's knowledge. If it's contained in the video, this witness doesn't have knowledge of it. Your Honor, I don't. I think you just indicated that from the stand, so. <coughs> Thank you. In fact, the male paramedic says that twice on your body cam that he received 100. Objection, Your Honor, outside the scope of this witness's knowledge. I think we can get there because of the time, so if you can. Objections over. any further questions. Can you redirect Ms. Slaughter? All right. Then uh, Officer Brown, you uh, may step down and are free to go. Thank you. Counsel, you want to just approach and talk about the schedule real quick, where we're at? All right, is this going to be you, Ms. Slaughter? It is, sir. All right, Ms. Slaughter, is the state prepared to call its next witness? They call Brian Dunbar, if they can. All right. Good morning, Mr. Dunbar. I'm going to have you come on up over here to the chair to my far left, if you would, sir. And then you can have a seat once you're there. Mr. Dunbar, that mic is live, and you can move it around, adjust it however okay. you'd like to get it situated for you. Um, Mr. Dunbar, I'm going to go ahead and swear you in first, if you please raise your right hand. Sir, do you swear or affirm? that the testimony you'll be giving this morning will be the truth. I do. All right, and then uh, you can put your hand down. For the record, can you please give me your first and last name and spell them both, please? Yes. Ryan, R-Y-A-N, Dunbar, D-U-N-B-A-R. All right, thank you, sir. Ms. Slaughter? Thank you, Your Honor. 
How are you currently employed? I'm an investigator with the Cedar Rapids Police Department. Investigator Dunbar, how long have you been employed with the Cedar Rapids Police Department? Approximately six and a half years. Are you a graduate of the Iowa Law Enforcement Academy or one of the academies in Iowa? I am. And which one did you graduate from? Uh, the Cedar Rapids Police Regional Academy. And can you recall what year you graduated? 2016. You are currently an investigator, correct? Correct. Have you always been an investigator? No. Can you tell us when you became an investigator? I applied for the investigative division in roughly the spring of 2020 and then was assigned in the fall of 2020. Prior to becoming an investigator, what role or position did you hold with the Cedar Rapids Police Department? I was a patrol officer um, who specialized in OWI, or impaired driving enforcement. And what does that mean? Uh, basically, I was a drunk driving car uh, that worked the entire city at night. Were you a drug recognition expert as well? Uh, yes, I still am. Still am. What does that mean? That means I'm specialized to uh, detect impairment uh, for drugs, including alcohol. Uh. So just to be clear, when you were a patrol officer in situations where there was an OWI and the person was suspected of being intoxicated or impaired by a drug, were you called in to evaluate them? Yes. And you have specialized training um, outside of normal OWI investigations that make you an expert in drug recognitions. Is that correct? Correct. I attended a, approximately a one month long school um, for Iowa Drug Recognition Expert Program. Now you said that you applied in the investigative division. Is that correct? Correct. Within the investigative division, are there multiple Are there multiple types of investigators? We're all kind of assigned different areas, but we all can work any type of investigation. What types of different areas? Can you give us some examples of what types of areas of investigation exist within that division? Sure. Um, for example, I'm currently assigned more or less as a burglary investigator. Um, uh, we have property crimes, which I would fall under. We have crimes against persons. Um, we have crime scene unit investigators and narcotic investigators and so forth. And you said you specifically are involved in property crimes and burglary crimes? Mainly, yes. When you became an investigator, did you receive any additional training on top of what you learned in the academy, your training with your field training officer, your DRE training? Did you get specific investigative training? Yes. What did that include? I remember going to three training schools. One was uh, advanced interrogation and interview techniques. Um, another one was advanced traffic stops. And then I think the third was advanced uh, report writing. Oh, excuse me, it was advanced search and seizure, not report writing. I apologize. Investigator, in general, you don't work a beat, correct? Correct. When you become involved in investigation generally, how are you typically assigned to different investigations? In example of an, uh, a burglary, it's reported to a patrol officer, and then let's say it would come back to the investigative bureau, and it might be assigned to me or my partner. Um, Let me break that down for okay. a second. So a patrol officer generally goes out and responds to a call. Correct. When you say it goes back to the investigative bureau, what does that mean? So their report is reviewed by my supervisor, who then will determine if it... Um, holds enough solvability criteria to be assigned to an investigator like myself to conduct further follow-up on. So once that original report is assigned to the Investigations Bureau, it's reviewed, and if 
determined by the supervisor, then you would be personally assigned to a specific case. Correct. Do you handle calls that occur all throughout the city? Uh, very rarely. Are there specific areas that you generally respond to? So I more or less cover the east side of Cedar Rapids for burglaries. Um, my partner who uh, covers the west side predominantly, we do go out um, and assist patrol when we can, uh, when time allows. How, where's the division line between east and west part of the city? We use the river line as the east and west divider. So west side of the river is considered west, east side of the river is considered east. Yes. And so you work the east side of the river typically? Typically, yes. In June of 2021, specifically um, investigator Dunbar, June 15th of 2021, were you employed as an investigator with the Cedar Rapids Police Department? Yes. And did you happen to become involved in an investigation regarding um, an incident or incidents that occurred at 4414 Oakleaf Court Northeast? Yes. Tell us how you became involved in that. I got to work sometime around 7.30 in the morning and um, overheard radio traffic about a possible shooting or shots fired. At that point, I listened in. Um, eventually, it was confirmed that there were several um, deceased individuals, and um, our supervisors asked myself and other investigators to respond. And did you respond? Yes. Are you assigned a specific um, marked patrol car? Uh, more or less, it's unmarked uh, that I drive. So when you received this call, were you at the station? I was at the station, yes. Did you then get in your assigned police vehicle and go to the scene? Yes. Were you alone? No, I had investigator Watkins uh, with me who was doing a, uh, a, a stint with the investigative bureau at the time. Can you tell us, Investigator Dunbar, when you went to the scene, um, where'd you pull up? I pulled up, I believe it was in around the 4200 block of Oak Leaf Court. And when you got there, can you walk us through what you did when you arrived? Sure. Uh, we were instructed to canvas the area for any video surveillance witnesses or anything else. Who um, does that instruction come from? It would have been either Lieutenant Dave Dostal or Sergeant Josh McAlpin at the time. So the, the assignment to conduct canvassing comes from an, a commander that's on scene? Correct. Can you explain to us, when you use the term canvassing, what that means? Yeah, so in this situation, um, we go house to house. We look around the area just in general for anything like video footage. Um, we look to see if there might be any people outside for witnesses. Um, anything else that might be of evidentiary value. So as you're walking a neighborhood, are you looking at the exterior of homes in a neighborhood? Yes. And when you're looking at the exterior of homes in a neighborhood, are you specifically looking for cameras? Yes. If you see a home, just in general, on a canvassing mission, when you see a home that has cameras, do you attempt then to make contact with the homeowner? Yes. Are you laughing because I called it a mission? <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> And then you also look for people who are outside. Yep. Yes. Do you attempt to make contact with folks who don't have cameras and are not outside? Yes. In this sort of situation, uh, we went to pretty much every house in the area. Can you... My screen's already up, Your Honor, but may I have your permission to republish the uh, map? You may. Investigator Dunbar, are you familiar with this 
uh, with this map or with the images that are depicted in the map? Yes. And can you tell us what this map in general covers? This would be a bird's eye view of Oakleaf Court and the crime scene. There should be a laser pointer up there um, for you to utilize as I go through this line of questioning. Okay. And just to let you know, it only works on the big screen. Okay. Okay, thank you. Can you show us generally where you parked when you pulled up? So I would have parked somewhere in this general area and we walked up to the scene. And approximately what time did you arrive um, in this neighborhood? I don't remember the exact time, but maybe around 9 a.m., give or take. After getting uh, the directive or the assignment to begin canvassing the area, did you do that? Yes. Can you recall the first house that you made a stop at? Yes. And do you recall the specific address? I believe it was 4417 Oakleaf Court. Can you point to us on this map um, what house was the first one you stopped at? Yes, it would be this house right here. And so just for records purposes, this would be the house to the west across the cul-de-sac from the 4414 Oakleaf Drive? Yes. Excuse me, Oakleaf Court Northeast? Yes. Okay. And whose residence was that? It was the Yang residence. When you approached uh, the Yang residence, can you tell us what, if anything specific, um, caused you to make contact with that house first? Well, due to the vicinity of the crime scene being directly across the street, and I did notice it had cameras on the exterior of the household. And when you noticed cameras on the exterior of the household, Investigator Dunbar, can you explain to us, um, firstly, where those cameras were mounted? If I'm recalling correctly, I believe they had a Nest camera on the front side of the house near the entryway, and they might have had a ring camera as well. And when you say a Nest camera, is that just the brand of it? That would be the brand of the camera, yes. And so there was a brand of camera called a Nest mounted to the front of the house? Yes. When you say you also believe there was a ring door, ring camera, can you recall where that camera would have been mounted? I believe it was near the front door. Did you make contact with one of the homeowners at that residence? Yes. And which specific homeowner did you make contact with? I believe the first person I spoke to was uh, Bao Li Yang, and his daughter was also home, Lydia Yang. When speaking with the Yangs, did you or were you able to confirm whether or not the Nest camera mounted in the front of the home was operational? I did. And did you have an opportunity to view uh, portions of that uh, footage? Yes. And can you describe for us what, what time period of footage that you had an opportunity to watch? Yes, um, I believe it was Mr. Yang gave me access to the camera and I reviewed the footage from approximately 6 a.m. to I believe it was approximately 8.30 a.m., roughly when officers arrived on scene. At that time when you were reviewing it, were you doing that at the Yang household? Yes. And between 6 a.m. and 8.30, we're talking two and a half hours, correct? Correct. At that time, Investigator Dunbar, did you do a minute-for-minute minute review? No, the Nest camera only allows you to scroll, so I did a quick scan through the two and a half hours to see if I noticed anyone outside or anything suspicious. In that brief review of the Nest camera that you did while at the Yang residence, was there anything that you did observe um, as far as people in the area? The only thing I noticed during the scan of video footage was a white work van. I think it was around approximately 6 a.m. A white what van? Work van, or utility a van, excuse me. Were you able to determine uh, if that white utility van belonged in the area? 
Later on, there were several houses we looked or that we could see that were under construction, so it didn't seem surprising to see the workman. Anything else that you observed? No. Did you review it up to the point where you saw officers arrive on scene? Yes. And so the Nest camera that was mounted to the front of the Yang household was able to capture police officers? Yes. May we approach? You may. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I've been informed that this was a good time to take our lunch break. So we will uh, start our lunch break now. Um, even though it's a few minutes before noon, we'll still pick up at 1.15. So I ask that you be back ready to go by 1.15. Um, again, I'd remind you of the admonition that I gave you last week just to hit the high points again. Um, still more evidence to go, so keep an open mind. Don't make any decisions. Um, do not uh, discuss this case with anybody else, including amongst yourselves. Uh, avoid any media coverage of this case. And again, no sorts of investigation uh, by you about uh, anything related to this case, people, places, um, uh, or anything you have, a, uh, anything else related to this case. So with that, uh, you are free to go and have a good lunch. Unless you need them. I mean, I wasn't going to, yeah. We don't need you here. I don't need you here till after lunch. I don't know if Ms. Slaughter needed you or not. You folks can sit down. Um, is there, I guess, when we were up here, I was informed uh, about more potential objections, so we might as well just deal with that now, it seems like, rather than just wait and maybe recess the jury. But uh, um, before we do that, Anything else? I know there's a um, issue, a potential issue related to, demonst to a demonstrative exhibit this afternoon. Um, I don't know if you want to make a record on that now, or you guys want to wait, or I mean, you it might be helpful, Your Honor, if Mr. Johnston informs the court what his objection is to the piece of demonstrative evidence, so that you're aware of that when you're looking for it. All right, looking let's at just it. start with that then. This is, uh, as I understand it, is this the, uh, uh, I believe an opening statement, you mentioned a YouTube video? Correct, Your Honor. Um, during the investigation by Investigator Bosenberg, in order to uh, figure out how to operate this firearm, he had to watch an online video um, that demonstrates a, essentially a tutorial. Uh, it's approximately five and a half minutes that showed him how to load, unload, and break down this firearm in order for him to do his, um, his investigation into the firearm. Uh, that video was provided to the state and then provided to the defense, and apparently the defense has some objections to the video. All right, and again, just to be clear, you're not offering this as substantive evidence I mean, you're not offering it as an exhibit, I guess I mean. You're offering it just for demonstrative purposes. Is that correct? That is correct, Your Honor, that I'm not offering it for substantive purposes. However, I did want to also, because we had 
talked in addition uh, to trying to find out the court's parameters as far as uh, handling of the firearm in the courtroom. And so though it's not being offered necessarily for substantive purposes, it's also being offered um, to try and minimize the amount of handling done with the firearm in a courtroom full of people. All right, so Mr. Johnson, why don't you just, for the record, let me know what your issues are uh, or objections are to the, uh, the, the video that's been displayed. Well, Your Honor, I don't have any objection to the video showing how to load and not load the, or unload the firearm. There's just a lot of talk on this video by this guy. Uh, uh, extraneous talk about the firearm, its history, what a great weapon it is, and all these things um, that we don't need. My proposal to Ms. Slaughter was to simply show the video without the audio, and uh, the witness on the stand could narrate you know, what, the, what the jurors are seeing. But there's a lot of parts where the gun is also being fired, um, also which I think could be prejudicial. So I would prefer, my objection is that we just show the, the part of the video where the witness can testify that we had to look at this video and show the part of the video that shows the loading of the firearm and leave it at that. Ms. Slaughter, what is the, I guess, I haven't seen it, I will view it over the lunch break, but from the state's perspective, what is the commentary add or why is that necessary to the video? I disagree with the characterization of what that commentary is. Um, there definitely is explanation and narration regarding the firearm, which, Your Honor, my understanding of what demonstrative evidence is, is exactly that, um, evidence that is not substantive in nature, but would be used um, to clarify or explain other evidence that is in uh, being used substantively in this case. And I think that that's exactly what the narration of this video does, especially since that narration is what explained to this officer how to operate the firearm. And as far as, I guess, Mr. Johnson's uh, also indicated that, again, I'll watch the video. I haven't seen it, so I'm doing all this <laughs> questioning without having seen the video at this point. But uh, Mr. Johnson suggested that we stop the video uh, or, or not show it, the gun being fired. Is that... Why is that necessary from the state's perspective? The firing of the uh, weapon in the video also gives um, information related to the, the volume of the firing from this video, uh, which is an issue here, the, the lack of gunshots heard. Um, it's, it's a small, quiet rifle, and this video demonstrates how it's used, what it sounds like when it's used, how it's loaded, how it's unloaded, how it's broken down. Um, it demonstrates the gun. All right, may I, may I just add that this is not the same gun. It's a, it's a like gun, it's a, but it's not the same firearm that was in this case. All right, anything else from either one of you, Mr. Johnson, Ms. Slaughter, related to the, the call it the YouTube video? Not now, Judge. Only just uh, for, to point out that this is the kind of thing that we tell the jury not to do. So I, that's what was my other concern with using a YouTube video. Like I said, I'm completely fine with the video showing, depicting the loading and unloading of the gun. I think it's a great idea so that the witness doesn't accidentally point the gun in the direction of the jury or anything like that, and I'm all in favor of it. Just not with the, just not with the audio. And, and the, or the depictions of the gun being fired. All right. Okay. Um, turning next, I guess, to where we left off right before lunch with uh, testimony. I think when you came up, Ms. Slaughter, you indicated you were going to move on from the Yang residence and ask uh, Officer Dunbar about other residences, and Mr. Johnson said he was going to object. Again, I... That's all I know at this point, so I don't know, Mr. Johnson. Did you want to make a record on that? Yes, Your Honor, and I just want to state, and I don't know what Ms. Slaughter was planning on going into, but if it's just for the purpose of cameras and where they're pointed, um, I, from what I have from my police report, I have uh, Mr. Hansen's residence at 5100 Spring Oak, uh, Charles Choi, 5101 Spring Oak, and... Uh, those are the only ones that I know about um, other than the Yangs that have already been um, discussed. So 
if, if it's just about cameras and where they were pointed, I don't really have an objection. It's just the Downies were one of the places, and Edwin Downey has testified, but I don't want him going into hearsay about what Edwin Downey or uh, Louise Downey told him. Um, and I was concerned because of the court's previous ruling that Ms. Slaughter might think that she can go into those things. Um, and again, if it's, if it's limited to the cameras and where they were pointed, then I don't have an objection to any of that. Well, Ms. Slaughter, I don't, know, I don't know that you're required at this point. I mean, we can deal with these case by case because I'm not even sure at this point if an objection <laughs> will be lodged or, or not. And that just depends on, I guess, the questions asked. Um, so I'm happy to defer this and, and rule on them as they come uh, unless you want to shed some light on this at this point, Ms. Slaughter. Uh, I'll shed minimal light, but I would like to defer this until the issue arises and I get an actual objection to something that's been asked of a witness on the stand. Uh, I do understand what hearsay is. I do think there are some statements that were made to police officers that do not qualify as hearsay that would be admissible. And I don't intend to offer any hearsay that doesn't have a uh, recognized exception, Your Honor. Okay. Well, we'll deal with it as it comes up. And Mr. Johnson, did you want to say something else? I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to avoid having to usher the jury in and out. Well, and that was my only point. We may not have to. I mean, if you want to object based on hearsay, I mean, again, I don't want not going to have lengthy speaking objections so I mean if you think she's asking for hearsay and she simply responds not offers for the truth of the matter sir, or however she's going to respond I'm, I you know if I need more argument I'll ask for it and we can address it outside the presence of the jury but you know most of these hearsay objections oftentimes are ruled on on the spot based on you know the hear the objection and the response and I'm prepared to do that uh, if if that's appropriate under the existing circumstances at the time. Well, I'd at least like to have some notice then okay. whether instead of them saying, well, what happened when you got to the Downey residence? And then they start talking about what the Downeys told them. I don't have an opportunity to interpose an objection. That's another one of my concerns. So I would at least like some notice when, when it hearsay is about to start coming in. But I understand the court's ruling. All right. What <clears throat> Your Honor, you said you wanted to make a record about the firearm. I don't know what, if it might be better reserved to have that conversation once Your Honor has had an opportunity to review the video to see what we need. Because what I want to do with the firearm is going to be dependent on what your ruling is regarding this piece of demonstrative evidence. So we may need to hold off on that. Yeah. I but mean, otherwise, I, I don't know anything else that we need to discuss on the record. My only rec I mean, the only thing I wanted to make a record on is how we're going to handle the firearm in court cleared the weapon, um, you know, uh, will not be pointing it uh, any direction, uh, those kinds of things. So, and then, again, we don't need to do it now. At some point, uh, if, as it appears likely, uh, based on what I understand, uh, the gun is offered and admitted into evidence, then we'll also need to make a record on how we're going to, I mean, you know, I have no plans on sending the firearm back to the jury. Um, if they would want to look at it, we would make that available to them here in open court somehow, but we can discuss the details of that later. But um, anything else, Ms. Slaughter? I don't think unless you, you, I don't think necessarily, Your Honor, that we need to make the procedural record about how to handle the firearm on the record, but I, I would like more information, yes. Yeah. All right, Mr. Johnson, anything further we need to make a record on at this point? No, Your Honor. All right, and that'll conclude the record.
to talk to him about number six and number 160 right off the bat when they come in. All right, uh, we are on the record. We have counsel and Mr. Jackson present. We are outside the presence of the jury to make a record on a couple things. Um, first, uh, over the lunch hour, I did have a chance to review the demonstrative exhibit related to the what aforementioned YouTube video. Um, this is the uh, this video of the firearm at issue and kind of how it works and whatnot. Um, and after viewing that video, I agree with Mr. Johnston that some of it um, is not really relevant and goes perhaps beyond demonstrative purposes. So I've got uh, discussion with counsel. I've got timestamp start at 150 of that, end at 325, and then start at 452 and end at about 520. And then that's it. My understanding, we all kind of looked at the video together um, in chambers with Mr. Jackson there. Mr. Johnson, you don't have any issue with the times. You're still objecting to um, the voiceover. Is that correct? Yes. All right. So that objection is noted, but I am going to uh, allow the state to play that for demonstrative purposes with those noted timestamps. We also talked about the need for the state to provide a copy of the demonstrative exhibit, which will be admitted as court exhibit one. And related to that, we talked about the other demonstrative exhibit that's been used quite a bit, that being the map. It's my understanding that the parties have agreed to actually submit that as an exhibit so the jury would have it available to them and that it would be admitted as state's exhibit 160. And, um, I'll inform the jury of that when we begin our um, resume with them after the lunch hour. Is that correct on the state's end? Yes, sir. All right. And I am going to remind both of you just to turn on your mics when you're speaking. It helps with the uh, people who may be viewing. So, um, Mr. Johnson, uh, is that correct on your end as far as the map? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Then, lastly, um, I think after Mr. Um, uh, Officer Investigator Dunbar testifies, my understanding is the next witness that the state plans on calling is the um, uh, medical examiner. And uh, I was alerted to an objection by the state. Uh, the state has, I believe, has forty, I believe, total autopsy photos for the um, the three. Um, decedents in this case. And so, uh, Mr. Johnson, you indicated you objected to those videos. I'll let you make, or excuse me, those photos. I'll let you make your objection on the record. Thank you, Your Honor. As Your Honor knows, we had a number of jurors who talked in voir dire about reacting negatively to photos of dead people. I didn't even get to autopsy photos um, or mention those to the jury, which is my fault. But I don't think we need to make it worse by putting in 40 separate photos when the the nature of this crime is not at issue. It's, it's who did this crime. Now, there's plenty of evidence in the record. The state doesn't have a need for photographs of the injuries from the autopsy. There was going to be very little questioning of that witness by, the, by us. Um, the, the injuries to these people are obvious and multiple. There, there's no doubt about premeditation. There's no doubt about malice. It's whoever killed these people did so with the intent to kill them uh, based on the multiple rounds that were fired and based upon uh, the, you know, the fact that uh, there would have been plenty of time to premeditate going from room to room. Um, so we don't believe that uh, autopsy photos, the state does not have a need for the autopsy photos. They're more prejudicial than probative for that reason, and we would object to all 40 of them. Uh, Ms. Slaughter, Mr. Shear, who wants to address this from the state's end? Ms. Slaughter? 40 autopsy photos for three different dead bodies is minimal, Your Honor. 
the photos were selected very strategically to avoid gore. Uh, they walk f from the moment that the body bag um, with the deceased remains inside of them arrives at the MEs to what is in the body bags at the time that the seal is broken and confirms the toe tag to the bag tag. The rest of them are what are considered clean photographs. They take place after the bodies have been washed. Uh, they're not overly gruesome, for lack of a better word, Your Honor, and I don't see uh, any reason why they would not be admitted. Further, regardless of the defense contention that this is a murder and we're just here debating on who committed the crime, the state still has elements of each crime to prove. And some of those are proven through the, frankly, viciousness and calculatedness of these wounds to each of the deceased bodies. And therefore, uh, we're asking that the ones that were um, submitted as proposed exhibits uh, be permitted by the court. And go ahead. Viciousness is exactly what we're talking about. Viciousness isn't an element of the offense. And it's the viciousness that the state wants to get out uh, by these photos. And it shows that they're meant to inflame the passions of the jury. And again, that's why we're objecting to those photographs. Ms. Slaughter, you look like you have something more to say. Viciousness, maliciousness, same thing. It's synonymous, Your Honor. All right. I, again, over the noon hour, um, I went back. I had looked at them already, but went back and looked at the autopsy photos. I would agree that, um, I guess, in the... Nobody can ever say uh, autopsy photos are um, pleasant to look at or not gory or not troubling, but in the scheme of autopsy photos that I've seen, these are um, not as bad as some I've seen. I would agree a lot of them, in fact, um, are frankly just pictures of bullets that I presume were found, um, clothes, tags, um, the pictures of the wounds and uh, are not uh, overly gory, as Ms. Slaughter said. I do agree that the state has to prove certain things in this case, and um, they have to prove cause of death, they have to prove malice of forethought, um, and uh, they're entitled to do so by presenting their case. And so for those reasons and the reasons articulated by Ms. Slaughter, um, I, I'm not going to sustain or the, any objection to the autopsy photos based on the grounds raised by Mr. Johnson at this point are overruled. So with that, are we ready to bring in the jury, Ms. Slaughter? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Johnson? Your Honor, um, first of all, may I have a standing objection to the autopsy photos? I plan on lodging my first objection, but I don't want to have to keep making it. Yeah, I mean, I think I've definitively ruled on uh, the grounds you've raised. So with respect to the ground you've raised about uh, respect to the autopsy photo, uh, I'll consider it a standing objection. I mean, I think I've definitively ruled on it, and there'd be no, no need to object to every single photo based on that ground. Thank you, Your Honor. Also, I just want the record to reflect we did have a discussion in chambers about um, Officer Dunbar, Investigator Dunbar's uh, testimony, in that um, if, if the state plans to get into any hearsay statements made to Office Investigator Dunbar about the relationship between the Jacksons, um, that they would approach the bench first before they ask that question as per the court's uh, previous ruling. Right. That was already ruled on the motion limine. I trust the state has read that and will comply with it. And you alerted them to that again in chamber. So, all right. With that, are you good to bring in the jury, Mr. Johnson? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Can we bring Dunbar back up to the stand? Yeah. Investigator Dunbar, you can come on up.
number six as well. Yep. Seated. Hope everybody had a good lunch break. Um, you may remember we were uh, still, uh, I think, with direct examination of uh, Investigator Dunbar uh, by Ms. Slaughter. Before we resume with that, a couple what I will refer to as housekeeping matters that I want to update you on. First, you've seen a lot of a map um, so far. Um, originally, that was not going to be admitted as an exhibit. The parties have now agreed that it makes sense for that to be an exhibit in this case. So um, I um, will admit um, by agreement the map as State's Exhibit 160 and just confirm the slaughter that's acceptable to the state. It is wrong. Mr. Johnson, is that acceptable to Mr. Jackson? Yes, Your Honor. All right. And then so. Uh, from now on, we will hopefully remember to refer to the map as Exhibit 160. And again, just for your reference purposes, that will be available to you as Exhibit 160 when you begin your deliberations. The other housekeeping matter you may, may remember several days ago now, but uh, there was an Exhibit number, I believe, 6. And this is the um, camera video from the Yang residence that was admitted and I think I said it was admitted subject to there was a bench conversation that occurred just for your information any of the issues that were addressed in the bench conversation have been resolved and exhibit six is admitted uh, as submitted um, and uh, just in case you had any questions or uh, were wondering about that so no further issues with exhibit six and it's admitted without any reservations, objections, or qualifications at all at this point. So with that, uh, I think we're ready to resume with uh, Investigator Dunbar. And Investigator Dun Dunbar, even though we've had a break, um, I'm not going to swear you in. You're still on the stand. I'm just going to remind you, sir, that you are still under oath. And with that, Ms. Slaughter, you may resume your questioning. Thank you, Your Honor. Investigator Dunbar, prior to us taking our lunch break, <clears throat> We were talking about uh, you being at the Yang's residence. Is that correct? Yes. Your Honor, may I have the map back up? And I do not need the lights dimmed. Are you referring to Exhibit 160? 160. My apologies, Your Honor. All right. Should be up. Thank you. After leaving the Yang residence, did you continue your can canvassing efforts? I did. And what house did you go to next? The next house I went to was the Downey residence. And when you say the Downey residence, who lived there? Uh, Luis and Edwin Downey. And do you recall the address at that house? I believe it was 4330 Oakleaf Court. Is that house visible on the map shown in Exhibit 160. It is. Can you use that uh, laser pointer again and show us which house belonged to the Downies? I believe it is that one right there. And I'm going to do it on the television just because it's a little clearer. But from my understanding of what you just pointed at with that laser pointer, you were pointing to the house, two house to the south of 4414. Correct. The house that I'm circling with my cursor, is that the house that you pointed to on the big screen? Yes. When you uh, went to that address, was there something about that house that drew your attention to it for canvassing purposes? There was a video camera system on the front of the house that I could see from the street. When you went to the Downey's house, did you make contact with the residents? I did. And in speaking with the residents, did you mention to them the cameras? Yes. During your canvas at the Downey residence, did you 
receive information related to the directionality of those cameras. Yes. And how many cameras were there? Two. Where was the second one located? On the back, uh, I believe pointed towards the porch. So the rear camera at the Downey's residence pointed towards their porch? Correct. And where did the front camera point towards? Downwards towards the front porch. Was there anything else that either of the Downies saw on June 15th of 2021 that had, um, that you felt had any investigatory value? Response? Not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted, Your Honor. The objections are ruled. You can answer the question. No. After you canvassed at the Downies house, did you continue your canvassing efforts? Yes. And was there another house that you went to during your canvassing? Yes. And can you tell us what the address of that house was? I believe it was 5000 Spring Oak Court. Using the cursor again, can you show us on the big screen which house that was? Yes, I believe it was that one right there. And so me using my mouse, would this be the first house at the north west corner of Oakleaf Court Northeast and Spring Oak Court Northeast? Correct. What about that house investigator drew your attention to it or made you want to stop there to canvas? They also had a camera on the front area of the house. And how many cameras in total were located at that house? They stated they had two cameras. Whose house was that? It was uh, I believe a Christopher and Anita Hansen. Did you collect any of the security cameras or security footage from that address? No. Why? Due to the location of the house um, and the footage that we already collected from the Yang residence, uh, at the time I didn't feel it evidentially or valuable to collect that footage right there. Additionally, Christopher Hansen mentioned that. Um, I don't have any objection, Your Honor. I don't think that the remainder of that uh, answer was responsive to my question. All right. The objection is sustained. Go ahead and ask your next question, Ms. Slaughter. Thank you. Um, Investigator Dunbar, when speaking with the Hansons, uh, did you ask them if they had seen anything out of the ordinary on June 15th of 2021. I did. Well, the objections overruled. Did I, you ask them? Yes, sorry. And had they seen anything that they considered out of the ordinary? Objections overruled. No. Did your canvassing efforts continue after that? Yes. And was there another house on Spring Oak Court Northeast that you stopped at? Yes. And which house was that? I believe it was 5001 Spring Oak Court. Maybe 5101? That sounds correct, yes. Okay. It was directly across the street. And when you say directly across the street, are we talking the southwest corner? Yes. Is this the house? Um, and when I say southwest corner, I apologize. Southwest corner of Spring Oak Court Northeast and Oak Leaf Court Northeast intersection? Yes, that's the house. What about that house made you stop there? Um, it was right across the street from the Hansons and it was nearby. Were there any cameras on that house? No. Did you speak with the homeowners at that address? Yes. Did they see anything out of the ordinary that morning? Overruled. No. What did you do, investigator, after you went to the 5101 Spring Oak Court Northeast address? I believe uh, we completed our canvas for that, more, that day. Did that conclude your involvement in this case? No. What else did you do? The following day, uh, investigator DeMoss and myself were instructed to go back out to 4414 Oakleaf Court and conduct an additional canvas uh, around the household and in the wooded area. 
And when you say you were instructed, who were you instructed by? Uh, commanders in this uh, investigative division. Uh, Lieutenant Dave Dostal and I believe Lieutenant Josh McKelvin. Were you given specific instructions on what additional canvassing they wanted you to complete? Yes, they wanted Investigator DeMoss and myself to focus our canvas in the wooded area um, to the north and east of the residence um, due to the defendant claiming that the suspect had exited the house and that was a possible path of travel. Looking in, uh, looking at a zoomed in image of exhibit 160, the map as we've previously been calling it, can you use your, will you actually, ma'am, will you dim it just a little bit for me, please? Investigator, I'm going to have you come down from the witness stand, please, and use the television instead of the big screen. Can you point out for us what specific areas of the wooded area that you're referring to you performed a canvas in? How far uh, to the west of the house did you go in the wooded area? And so when you say where it became thick and difficult to travel in, are you meaning it was thick and difficult to travel further to the west? Uh, I was attempting to go all the way up to like Cherry Road. Uh, there's a lot of down trees on the brush. So I was wondering if you could get like Cherry Road instead of the Cherry Road. Um, I'll just talk to you just raise your hand. Can I please take that again? Yes, sorry. Um, I traveled to the north to us to Cherry Road. Thank you. If you can have a seat, please. Ms. Slaughter, are you done with uh, Exhibit 160 for the time being? For now, yes, Your Honor. All right. When you say due to derecho damage, those of us who were here for the derecho know what that means, but can you describe what you saw in the woods that was preventing you from getting through the woods to Usher Ferry? Uh, as I previously stated, there were downed trees, thick brush. It was um, so thick that I couldn't get any farther north to Usher's Ferry Road like I wanted to. So I took my uh, vehicle and I drove around to Usher's Ferry Road and then canvassed back southward. Um, while I did so, I had to climb over several trees, almost like a balancing act, act on one of the tree limbs just to get back southwards towards the residence. So when you got back in your car, you drove around to Usher Ferry Road? Correct. And when you say you continued your canvassing efforts, came in at the top side of that wooded area and worked your way towards the house? Correct. Were you able to get through the downed trees in the brush to get back into the backyard area of 4414? Yes, but it was difficult. You said you had to climb over some trees? Yes. Touched a lot of things? Yes. Damage your clothes at all? Um, I don't know if I damaged my clothes, but they were very dirty. Very dirty? Yes. Did you make any canvassing efforts at the homes on Usher Ferry Road? Yes. Uh, when I was done canvassing southwards back towards the residence, I re-entered my vehicle and I went, I guess, technically north and south on Usher's Ferry Road um, all the way to Blair's Ferry looking for additional camera uh, systems. Was there anywhere that you stopped on Usher Ferry Road? Yes. And is that location where you stopped uh, visible 
on the map shown in Exhibit 160? Yes. May I have that back, Your Honor? You may. Can you see the house on the big screen? Yes, I believe it was that one right there. And what made you stop at that house? They had a video system on the front area of the house. I don't remember exactly where. Were you ever able to make contact with the occupants or residents of that home? I don't recall for sure. I think they contacted me at a later date and said the camera... Exactly. All right, uh, the objection is overruled. Uh, um, Investigator Dunbar, if you remember, you can finish your answer. Okay. I'll, I don't recall if they contacted me. Did you ever collect any video from that household? No. While you were canvassing the wooded area between the backyard at the Jackson home and Usher's Ferry Road, was there anything of evidentiary value that you found? No. Nothing further for this witness, Your Honor. Mr. Johnson, cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Investigator. Good afternoon. You, uh, as a police officer, are trained in making reports, correct? Correct. You're told that you can write all you want in a report, right? Yes. There's no page limit? Correct. There's no word limit? Correct. And if you see something of importance, you put it in your report? Correct. And if you hear something of importance, you put that in your report? Correct. And you would agree that people who didn't see anything that morning would be important, wouldn't it? Yes. And yet, in your entire report about the canvassing that you did, you did not once mention that any of these people said they didn't see anything that day, did you? I'd have to see my report. Your Honor, may I, may I approach? You may. I believe so. And did you put in there in any of those conversations that any of those people told you that they didn't see anything that day? I believe the Yangs did. So you did put it in for the Yangs. You're saying it's in your report that the Yangs said they didn't see anything? I thought they said they didn't hear or see anything. Maybe I misread that. You said the young stated that this was not abnormal and they did not notice anything out of the ordinary. But there's nothing in here about them not seeing anything that day. Oh, wait. You said they had not heard anything this morning. Is that what you meant? 
Uh, yeah, that's what I saw. Okay, so when somebody tells you that they didn't see anything that morning, you knew how to write it down, right? Correct. And you put it in your report. Correct. So when the Yangs told you they didn't see or hear anything that morning, you wrote that down. Yes. And yet you didn't write it down for anybody else, correct? I did not see that, correct. You didn't write it down for the Downies, right? Correct. You didn't write it down for Mr. Hansen? Correct. And you didn't write it down for Mr. Choi? Correct. And of course you wrote nothing down on the 4461 Usher's Ferry because they never got back to you. Yeah, they didn't answer the door either. So basically you didn't ask them. I would have asked them. And you would have put it in your report if you had. If they saw something abnormal or out of the ordinary, I would have doc documented that. Now, turning your attention to Mr. Hansen, I believe you testified that that was 5,000 Spring o or Oak Court Northeast. That, could that have been 5,100? I could have gotten the address wrong. Would you rely on your report as opposed to what you testified to? If I could see my report, yes, I'd go off that. Take my word for it. It says it's no big deal. I don't care that you got the address wrong. I'll take your word for it. Okay. All right. That's fine. And uh, but you did have a conversation with Mr. Hansen at that residence, did you not? Yes. It was relatively brief, but yes. And he said he had two cameras. You testified about that. Yes. But he but he did not believe any of them pointed towards the area of 4414 Oakleaf Court. Correct. And that's why you didn't collect any video from that camera. I apologize. Um, it was my belief that maybe the backyard camera might point that direction, but due to the video I saw at the Yang's residence, uh, which covered all of Oakleaf Court and I think Scarlet Sage Drive, um, I didn't find it important at that time to stop for an extended period of time to gather that video right then. I'm saying you didn't gather any video from his house, did you? No, I did not. And it would have, he said he did not believe any of them pointed towards the area of 4414 Oak Leaf Court. Okay. That's what you wrote, right? Do you want to see it? That's okay. I believe you. So that's why you didn't collect it, because it wouldn't have been pointed in the right direction. It would have been pointed northbound or north northwards, and there was a wooded area behind the Hanson's house, so I probably was thinking that it didn't capture anything. Okay. Thank you. And then with respect to 5101 Spring Oak Court that you've testified to, Mr. Choi told you he didn't have any cameras. Correct. Again, nothing in there about asking him whether he saw anything or not. There's nothing in your report about that, is there? If he saw something, I would have documented it. So as I understand your testimony about the next day, you're saying that you couldn't get through the woods in your initial effort when you were going towards Usher's Ferry Road from the Jackson House. Correct. But you could get to the Jackson's house, Jackson House when you went south from Usher's Ferry Road back towards the Jackson's House. You were able to make it all the way. Yeah. Excuse me. <clears throat> I had to go up the embankment and there was a down tree that I was able to hop up on and cross over so I could get through the heavy shrubbery and trees. So maybe you just went through a different way on the way back than you went on the way out. I tried to position my vehicle right where I had ended my initial uh, canvas northbound, so I tried to make it about the same area. I understand, but maybe you didn't take exactly the same path. Possibly. And also maybe you were trying a little harder. Uh, okay, okay. Well, I'm just, I'm just asking you, is that possible that you just made a greater effort on the way back? I feel like if I could have got to Usher's Ferry Road, I would have. <laughs> well, I mean, is there any reason why you could, get, you could only make it one way and not the other way? Because of the down trees and shrubbery. Right, but I'm just saying, what difference does it make which, which approach you use? Well, it was uphill to get to Usher's Ferry Road, and when I was coming back, it was downhill, so it was a little bit easier to get over the down trees. It was a little bit easier? Yes. Okay.
I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Any redirect, Ms. Slaughter? Just briefly, Your Honor. Investigator Dunbar, when you stopped at all of these residences during your canvassing efforts and made contact with the homeowners, would it be fair to say you asked several questions? Yes. And some of the answers to those questions were documented in your reports, I'm correct? Object leading, Your Honor. Overall, you can answer the question. Yes. At the end of your contact and or communication with the residents of these houses that you canvassed at, did you provide them a business card? All of them. And when you provided the business card, did you tell them if you can think of anything else or remember anything out of the ordinary that comes to mind later, call me? Yes, and I did circle my email and phone number. On the business card? Yes. And so is it your testimony today, Investigator Dunbar, as you sit there, that you asked all of the people that you canvassed at whether or not they had seen anything out of the ordinary? Yes. And asked them if they remember something out of the ordinary later, give me a call? Yes. Nothing further, Your Honor. Mr. Johnson, anything further? Um, again, you were able to write that down when you talked about the Yangs and you put it in your report that they didn't see anything out of the ordinary, correct? Correct. You didn't for anybody else in your report, did you? No. You knew how to write it, right? Correct. You had the time to write it, right? Yes. It was important information, was it not? Yes. And you didn't put it in your report? I did not. No further questions. Ms. Slaughter? Investigator Dunbar, you did put in your report, and I quote, each household I stopped at, I provided my business card and told them to contact me, you wrote him, not them, told him to contact me if anything out of the ordinary would come to mind at a later date, correct? Correct. Nothing further. Thank you, sir. Got another question, Mr. Johnson? No, Your Honor. All right. Uh, Investigator Dunbar, you may step down, and I believe you are free to leave. Thank you, Your Honor. Slaughter is the uh, state prepared to call sex witness. State calls Kelly Cruz to the stand, Your Honor. All right, ladies and gentlemen, while Ms. Cruz is coming up here after lunch, I know everybody may be feeling a little tired. Why don't you just stand and stretch real quick? I'm going to do the same. Just have a seat, please. And is it Dr. Cruz? Yes. Yeah, I swear you in if you raise your right hand. Dr. Cruz, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you'll be giving today will be the truth? I do. All right, and you can put your hand down. And just for the record, please, can you give me your first name and your last name and spell them both? My name is Kelly Cruz, K E L L Y K R U S E. Ms. Slaughter? Thank you. Dr. Kurz, how are you currently employed? I am an associate state medical examiner at the Iowa Office of the State Medical Examiner. Can you tell us a little bit about, or a lot, about your educational background that qualifies you for that position? Sure. So after I graduated from high school, I attended Tulane University and earned a Bachelor of Science in Anthropology. I then attended St. George's University, where I earned a Master of Public Health. I then stayed at their medical school and earned a Doctor of Medicine degree. Um, after I graduated from that in 2013, I then entered an anatomic and clinical pathology residency program. Uh, that was at a hospital in New Jersey. When I graduated from that in 2017, I completed a forensic pathology fellowship program, and that was at the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner of Maryland. Um, after I graduated from that program, I became employed by the office here in Iowa. 
Dr. Cruz, you used the word fellowship when describing some of your educational background. Can you explain to us what a fellowship is or what it means to be a fellow? Sure. Uh, so once someone graduates from medical school, they enter a residency, and that's where you learn about specialties within medicine. If you want to specialize even further, then you complete, complete a fellowship. Um, so my residency was in pathology, and my fellowship was in forensic pathology. You were also the chief resident, is that correct? Yes. Can you tell us what that means? Uh, there are usually a number of residents, so within each of the four years at my program, there were four to five residents. Um, once you become a fourth year, um, one or two people are picked to be in charge, essentially, of all the residents in their training. And you described a specified study or practice being pathology. Can you explain to us what pathology is? Pathology is the study of disease, uh, disease processes, um, and how those affect the human body. So what is the difference between pathology in general versus the forensic pathology that you did your fellowship in? Forensic pathology takes those disease processes, they look at them, and then also adds an injury and how disease and injury uh, affect the human body and ultimately lead to someone's death. Anatomic and clinical pathology, does that also differ from forensic pathology? Forensic pathology is uh, usually found within anatomic pathology. So what is anatomic then? Anatomic, so pathology can be broken up into those two different main groups. There's anatomic pathology and clinical pathology. Anatomic really deals with kind of whole people whole organs, so we get specimens from the operating room, we'll look at them with the naked eye, then we'll look at them under the microscope, really with the purpose of diagnosing any sort of natural disease like cancer. Um, and then clinical pathology looks more at like a cellular level. Um, they deal with blood banking, microbiology, virology, and the big one being chemistry in the hospital. What if any licensures or certificates do you hold? Uh, so I am board certified in anatomic pathology, clinical pathology, and forensic pathology. Um, and I also have a license to practice medicine in Iowa. As an associate state medical examiner, can you tell us what are your primary job responsibilities? Really, my number one responsibility um, at the office is to perform autopsies, write an autopsy report, and then determine cause and manner of death. Um, once I've determined cause and manner of death, I'm then required to sign the death certificate. Um, other duties that I have, I provide expert testimony on my cases, I talk to family members, I review medical records, toxicology reports, talk to law enforcement, gather evidence throughout the autopsy process and things along those lines. Um, we also do a lot of teaching in our office to medical students. Since you've been working as an associate state medical examiner, do you know approximately how many autopsies you've completed? Uh, since I've been working at the state medical examiner's office, I have performed about 1,000 autopsies um, and about 14 to 1,500 total throughout all of my training. When you perform an autopsy, is there an industry standard or specific protocols that you as a medical examiner follow um, in each autopsy that you do? I do. So we are accredited under the National Association of Medical Examiners. They provide guidelines on how to perform an autopsy and then using those guidelines, we also have standard operating procedures in our office. Um, so really no matter what kind of a case it may be, um, we essentially perform each autopsy the exact same way. Can you tell us generally what what way that is that the autopsies are performed? 
each autopsy can really be broken up into two parts. We have our external examination and the internal examination. Uh, the external examination starts from the beginning when the body is removed from the cooler um, where it has been placed waiting for the autopsy. Um, there the body will be weighed, measured in length. Um, anything on the outside of the body will be documented. So if there's clothing, medical therapy, um, jewelry, um, that will be documented, then removed. Um, then the body is washed, and then we do a head-to-toe examination of the body, looking at defining characteristics like hair color, eye color, um, tattoos. Um, we're looking for any sort of natural disease, um, say someone has surgical scars, and then looking for any evidence of injury. All of that is photographed and documented. Once that external examination is complete, then we perform the internal examination. That begins with collection of specimens. So we collect blood, um, vitreous fluid from the eyes, and then urine if it's available, really for the purpose of toxicology testing. Um, then we make a Y sort of incision. All of the organs are then removed. They're each weighed. Um, and then I look at each one for any evidence of disease or injury. Um, that includes all the chest organs, the abdominal organs, and the brain as well. Um, once that is complete and everything's documented, the organs are put back into the body. It is sewn back up and uh, sent to a funeral home. When autopsies are performed, do you do those by yourself or do you do it with a team? We have a team at our office. Uh, we perform multiple autopsies um, at any given period of time, uh, and we make use of autopsy technicians. So they're the ones who procure those specimens, um, take out the organs, weigh them for me. They'll measure um, the body, weigh it, um, and really help with anything else that we need, like picture taking. I'm assuming, are there more than one associate state medical examiner? Yes. Can you tell us how cases are assigned for autopsy when, when bodies come into the medical examiner's office? Uh, we receive bodies from almost the entire state. Um, so we perform autopsies on individuals who die in 97 of the 99 counties in Iowa. Um, so we have a log of when people come in um, and based on availability, um, you know, how difficult a case may be, um, we then make a schedule for the next day. The pathologist who performs the uh, autopsies um, is, does so based on a schedule and we receive a monthly schedule where we all rotate. Were you assigned as the associate medical examiner to perform autopsies on the body of Jan, Melissa, and Sabrina Jackson? Yes. Can you break down for us, well, strike that please. Each one of these autopsies that you did on the three people I just mentioned, were those done separately? Uh, two were done on the same day, and then one was done the following day. One is started and completed before you start and complete another one? Uh, they're usually done concurrently. Speaking specifically first, Dr. Cruz, about um, the autopsy performed on Jan Jackson, can you walk us through, um, can you walk us through the autopsy that you performed on him? Sure. I, so his autopsy was performed in the same standard way um, that we perform all autopsies. So uh, the body was removed from the cooler. It was weighed, measured, and then documented for medical therapy, clothing, um, he had bags on his hands. Those were all documented and removed. Um, and his clothing was also photographed separately. Uh, once all that was documented and removed, uh, his body was cleaned, um, and then I was able to determine he had a total of five gunshot wounds. Um, each one of those gunshot wounds was photographed, measured, um, documented for any sort of evidence of close range discharge of a firearm. 
And then once that external examination portion was complete, I then performed my internal examination portion. So there I was able to determine which organs were injured from the gunshot wounds and any sort of associated findings with that. Um, I was also able to look for any sort of natural disease that he may have, um, such as coronary artery disease, hypertension, fatty liver. Um, but he didn't have any sort of natural disease that would have accounted for his death. When a body is delivered to the state medical examiner's office, can you explain to us the manner in which that body is received? Each body should be received in a body bag um, with very, very rare exceptions and then with a lock um, on the zippers. Um, that lock has a number and it's photographed when, before we start the autopsy to show that that lock has not been broken. And that's just really for chain of custody purposes for any potential evidence. The, the tag that you refer to on the outside of the body bag. Um, is that the only tag associated with a body? Uh, there's that lock with the number and then a tag with their name on it. Is there a secondary tag on the body itself? Oh, yes. Okay, and should those match? Yes. Dr. Cruz, there is a uh, binder in front of you, if you could Please open that. Um, I would like you to flip specifically and look at the photographs previously marked States Exhibit 7 through States Exhibit 26. Sorry, was I supposed to go through all of them? Or through 26? Through 26, okay. Okay, you've had a chance to review those? Yes. Do you recognize the photos? Yes. And are they photographs that you took? Yes. Were they taken during the autopsy of Jan Jackson? Yes. And the images depicted in these photographs, do they fairly and accurately represent your findings that were discovered during your autopsy? Yes. Your Honor, at this time, the state would move to have state's exhibits 7 through 26 admitted into evidence. Any additional objections, Mr. Johnson? No additional objections, Your Honor. State's exhibits 7 through 26 are admitted. May I have permission to publish those exhibits, Your Honor? You may. Dr. Cruz, looking first at State's Exhibit 7, can you tell us what we are viewing in this photograph? So these are the two um, sort of items on the outside of the bag. On the left-hand side is that lock with the number. Uh, the photograph showing the lock um, was intact when received. And then on the right is a tag uh, with Jan Jackson's name. There's also a ruler shown in this photograph, is that correct? Yes. Can you explain to us um, what the purpose of the rulers are in your photographs? Uh, we have a ruler in every single photograph. Uh, the ruler has the case number. Um, so that is our just state medical examiner's office number for organizational purposes. And then also for helping um, if you want to measure um, or determine how big or small something may be. Looking next at state's exhibit eight, can you explain to us what we're looking at in this photograph? 
This is what we would call an as-is photograph of Mr. Jackson as he was received. So this photograph was taken right as the, after the bag was opened and nothing was moved. Can you explain to us, Dr. Cruz, what is on Jan Jackson's hands? Those are brown paper bags. Uh, we often have those covering the hands of many decedents, oftentimes when there are gunshot wounds or a concern for any potential trace evidence. Really the purpose is to protect the hands during that transportation process and while they're sitting in the cooler. Moving on to State's Exhibit 9, can you tell us what we're looking at in this photograph? This is the identification tag that was on Mr. Jackson, bearing his name. And did you form an opinion as to whether or not the tag on Mr. Jackson's person matched the tagging information that was on the outside of the body bag? Yes, they matched. States Exhibit 9, can you explain to us what we're looking at here? This is a photograph of Mr. Jackson's shirt after it had been removed. Yep. I apologize, I was just made aware I referred to this as Exhibit 9. This is State's Exhibit 10. Okay. Is there a reason, Dr. Cruz, that the clothing of Jan Jackson was photographed in this case? Yes. Can you explain that to us, please? Uh, there were holes in the shirt that corresponded to gunshot wounds that I had seen, and I wanted to have those documented. In the photo that's showing in Exhibit 10, I'm using my cursor circling an area. Are you able from this photo, Dr. Cruz, to see a hole in this shirt? Yes. And the hole that I'm referring to, pretty center right below the collar of the shirt, is that a gunshot hole or bullet hole? Yes, there was a bullet wound that corresponded to that hole. Are there any other defects from this vantage point in the shirt that you can see in this photograph? No, I can't appreciate any others. Moving then on to State Exhibit 11. Is this a zoomed in bless you, photograph of the same shirt that we just saw in Exhibit 10? Yes. And in this zoomed in photo, are you now able to see any additional defects in the shirt? Yes, there appears to be a second one right above the ruler. And would that be above the first zero in the ruler? Yes. Did the second one or second hole in the shirt that we're seeing in States Exhibit 11, did that also correspond with an injury on Jan Jackson's body? Yes. Looking at States Exhibit 12, can you explain to us, Dr. Cruz, what we're seeing in this photograph? So this is the back of Mr. Jackson's head um, after I had shaved it uh, so that I could better visualize two gunshot wounds. In the report of autopsy that you wrote, you described gunshot wounds to the occipital scalp. Do these, are these injuries in the occipital scalp? Yes. Are these the injuries that you referred to as being the right and left occipital scalp? Yes. Can you tell us what injury was sustained as a result of these two gunshot wounds? Both, for both gunshot wounds, the bullet entered into the skull. Uh, so there was injury to the scalp, the skull, the dura, which is a thin sort of membrane that covers the brain, and then injury to the brain as well with associated bleeding. When you reference left and right occipital scalp, is it his left or from the vantage point that you would be looking at them from? His left. Got a couple of these out of chronological order just to give some context, but moving next to State's Exhibit 14, can you tell us what we're looking at here? 
This is the left side of the upper forehead. Uh, here is another gunshot wound. Um, the wound, the more rounded one on the left hand side is the entrance wound. And on the right hand side, is uh, looking at the photograph is a partial exit wound. So part of the bullet broke off and exited while the rest of the bullet entered into the skull. And looking at 17, States Exhibit 17, is this the same injury? Yes. Zoomed in? Yes. From this vantage point, the injury shown to the left side of the photograph, is that the entrance wound? Here, so the entrance wound should be more of a rounded appearance. Let me just double check. It has a weirder look to it from that angle. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh. Yeah. The right side, the one on the, to the right, should be the entrance wound. The, the yeah. right side of the foot? The rounded, yes. Okay. And the left side, I apologize, this more V-shaped wound would be the partial exit wound. Yes, it's uh, turned compared to the other one. And States Exhibit 13, same injury? Yes. Zoomed in? Yes. Is there any explanation medically why the entrance wound is more circular and the exit wound or partial exit wound as you referred to it as more of a v-shaped wound when usually when the bullet has a clear path um, from the gun to the person and hits the skin it has a lot of energy so it actually bores a hole into that skin so there's part of the skin that's missing um, once that bullet hits something it loses a lot of energy um, so then when it goes to exit the body, it really sort of pokes through or lacerates the skin. Um, and so you don't have that rounded appearance. You really shouldn't be missing any skin. And you can uh, look at wounds and to determine if they're entrance and exit wounds by trying to put those edges of the wound together. So here on the right hand side, it's very round. You wouldn't be able to get those edges together. But on the left hand side, you can clearly see the edges of that wound come together. Looking at States Exhibit 15, can you tell us what we are seeing in this photograph? Uh, this is Mr. Jackson's chest. So at the top, um, you can see part of his facial hair. That's where his head is and his feet are at the bottom. Um, and two gunshot wounds can be appreciated. So I see an injury uh, center um, just below his chin. Is that a gunshot wound? Yes. Dr. Cruz, there... Um, there's some marking around the injury. Would that be fair to say? Some sort of discoloration, yeah. Can you give us any medical explanation for the discoloration around this wound? Uh, so that blue, purple, red, purple sort of appearance is what I call ecchymosis. Um, it's really just blood seeping into the soft tissue around that gunshot wound. Um, in areas of your body where you have more blood vessels, um, you will see more ecchymosis. Um, and here, you have a lot of blood vessels in that region of the body. And you said there was a second injury. In the bottom left-hand corner, there's a dark spot. Would that be the second injury that you're referring to? Yes. Is that also a gunshot wound? Yes. Looking at States Exhibit 16, can you tell us what we're viewing in this photograph? Uh, this is the top half of Mr. Jackson's body after it had been cleaned. Um, here we can see those two gunshot wounds, the one to the lower neck and one to the right side of the chest. Um, and then we also see more of his face where we can appreciate um, some injuries there as well. And how would you describe the injuries seen to the face of Mr. Jackson? The injuries to the face are blunt force injuries. So the T-shaped injury is an abrasion or a scrape. Um, he also has lacerations to his face on the right side of the nose, um, on the lips as well. And that's really just a tearing of the skin. And there's also bruising as well. Could the injuries that you refer to as scraped and lacerations on Mr. Jan Jackson's face have been caused from falling? Yes.
And then looking at States Exhibit 18, what are we seeing here? This is a close-up photograph of one of those lacerations on the inside of the lower lip. And would, is it possible that these injuries to the lip would also have been as a result of falling? It's possible, yes. You're not suggesting in any way that these are bullet holes? No, they're not. States Exhibit 19, there are words associated or on this photo. Can you tell us what that says, please? It says fragment from left forehead. And when you say fragment, is this a bullet fragment? Yes. And when you say left forehead, can you explain to us where specifically you found this bullet fragment? This bullet fragment um, is from that gunshot wound on the left side of the upper forehead. It was within the soft tissue of one of the wounds. And when you say within the soft tissue, would that be outside of the scalp or outside of the, the bone? Correct, embedded within the scalp, essentially. Thank you. And States Exhibit 20, where, what, what are the words on States Exhibit 20? Uh, right chest. And on the, on the right side of Mr. Jackson's body, that lower dark hole, is this fragment related to that hole? For both of the wounds that were seen in that photograph, so the bullet to the lower neck and the bullet to the chest, both entered into the chest cavity. Um, these fragments are from the one of the upper, of the lower neck, so the higher one. Um, that injured the right lung and the bullet um, fragmented. And so within that cavity um, are where we found multiple bullet fragments. And the words associated with States Exhibit 21? Left frontal bone. And where is the left frontal bone? Uh, it's really in the forehead region, so it would be associated with that bullet hole, the bullet holes on the left side of the forehead. States Exhibit 22, there are five very mm -hmm. small pieces or fragments of a bullet. Um, this says abdomen one, is that correct? Yes. Where sp specifically were these fragments located? Uh, these fragments were found within soft tissue in the organs of the abdomen. Uh, so that gunshot wound to the right side of the chest entered into the chest cavity, injured the lung, and then went into the abdominal cavity and injured the liver. So along the way, it left off little fragments, and along that wound path, specifically within the abdomen, I was able to recover these. And then States Exhibit 23, frontal lobe. What's the frontal lobe? Uh, so the frontal lobe um, is part of the brain that is underneath that frontal lobe and the front, the frontal bone and the frontal scalp, so really in the forehead region. Um, and a projectile or a bullet was recovered from the frontal lobe associated with one of the gunshot wounds of the head. And when you say of the head, are you referring to the occipital area, the back of the head? Correct. So he ended up having three bullets recovered from the, sc the skull and the brain associated with all three gunshot wounds of the head. And 24, can you read for us what that says? A frontoparietal lobe. Um, that's a part of the brain where each lobe isn't really clearly demarcated, so it's kind of where two of them meet. Um, so not quite towards the f exact front of the brain, but slightly back, um, another projectile was recovered. And did you associate that projectile from one of the shots in the back of the head as well? Yes. States Exhibit 25, is this additional fragments? Yes. And were these located in the right chest per the, the words written on the photograph? Correct. Uh, there was blood in the chest cavity, so that was collected and then sifted through to look for more bullet fragments. And while sifting through the blood from the chest cavity, that's where these fragments were found? Correct. 
and 26. So this is a projectile from the right side of the back. Uh, that bullet that entered into the chest cavity and then went into the abdomen was then lodged in the back and it was recovered. Dr. Cruz, during your examination of Jan Jackson, were you able to determine a specific time of death? No. Are there some fallacies associated with finding the time of death? There are a lot of misconceptions with determining time of death. Um, it's a big part of my job and really one of the most difficult things that I do. Is it possible to determine time of death? From an autopsy, an exact time of death cannot be determined. Dr. Cruz, during an autopsy where you are looking at gunshot wounds, are you, in general, able to form opinions regarding the distance from which someone was shot? Yes. And how do you do that? So when I am doing my external exam examination, I'm looking for evidence of close range discharge of a gun um, by determining if there's any soot deposition on the skin or if there's any stippling on the skin, um, which are little pinpoint abrasions that occur from gunpowder that um, is, is not completely burned and it hits the skin with such a force that it causes a little scrape or abrasion. Um, if I see one of those two things or potentially a muzzle imprint showing that there's been contact with a gun, I can say that the gun was likely fairly close um, to the skin. In terms of exact distance, I would need to have a test fire of the gun with the ammunition to know for sure, but I can say that it was likely fairly close. Generally, how, how does something like clothing interfere with your ability to make a judgment or form an opinion as to the distance from which someone was shot? Anything that comes in between the gun and the body um, will preclude that evidence of the close range. Um, so I won't necessarily see any soot. I may not see stippling. I do look at the clothing, but clothing's often quite bloody and it's difficult to determine. When you refer to soot and stippling, is there a distance in which you expect to see those type of deposits or those type of injuries on a body? Yes. What, what is that range or what is that distance? So soot um, travels the shortest distance. It's really that completely burned up um, gunpowder and it's quite light. Um, if you're looking at soot, you're looking at most likely within inches. Um, for stippling, that unburned gunpowder um, can travel a bit further. You may be looking at feet, um, but again, you would need to test fire for sure. When you talked about the effects that items between the gun and the body have on your ability to determine distance. Would that also apply to hair? Yes. Specifically, the hair on Jan Jackson's head, would that prevent your ability to determine the distance from which those two shots happened? Yes, um, especially due to the color. I, I didn't see any gunpowder particles um, and it would prevent that gunpowder from reaching the scalp and creating stippling. Similarly, his shirt. Correct. Dr. Cruz, did you form an opinion regarding, well, regarding firstly what the cause of death was for Mr. Jackson? Yes. And what is that? Multiple gunshot wounds. Did you form an opinion as to which of the multiple gunshot wounds um, specifically cause the death of Mr. Jackson? Each individually would be fatal on their own.
When you say that each individual shot would be fatal on its own, does that necessarily mean that death would be instantaneous? No, that does not. So just to clarify, is it possible that after sustaining, say, one of the chest wounds, that Mr. Jackson would still be alive? Yes. And so saying that each of the gunshots to Mr. Jan Jackson could have caused death, would it be fair to say that none of the gunshots to him were superficial? Correct. They all injured vital organs. Dr. Cruz, moving on to the autopsy performed on Melissa Jackson, did you form an opinion as to the cause of death of Melissa Jackson? Yes. And while, what was that opinion? I apologize. Uh, gunshot wounds of head. While performing the autopsy of Melissa Jackson, did you also photograph her injuries? Yes. And if you would open that book back up and flip to States Exhibits 27 through 36, let me know once you've had a chance to look at those. Are the photos seen in states exhibits 27 through 36 photographs that were taken of you, excuse me, by you of Melissa Jackson during her autopsy in June of 2021? Yes. And do the photographs depicted in those exhibits fairly and accurately represent the injuries that you observed during that autopsy? Yes. Your Honor, the state moves to admit 27 through 36 of states exhibits. Mr. Johnson? All right, then uh, states exhibits 27 through 36 are admitted. Permission to publish those exhibits, Your Honor? You may. Dr. Cruz, looking first at states exhibit 27, can you tell us what we're looking at in this photograph? I these are tags from the outside of the body bag. On the left is that locking tag uh, with the numbers, and on the right is an identification tag with Mrs. Jackson's name. And this photograph is taken from the outside of the body bag? Yes. Looking next, Dr. Cruz, at States Exhibit 28, can you tell us what we're looking at in this photograph? This is a, an identification tag that was found on the body, also bearing Mrs. Jackson's name. And did the identification tag on Melissa Jackson's body match the identification tag on the outside of the bag? Yes. And in States Exhibit 29, can you tell us what we're looking at here? This is an as-is photograph of Mrs. Jackson as she was received. So the photograph was taken right after the body bag was opened and nothing was moved. In this photograph are her hands also inside of the brown paper bags that we saw on Jan Jackson's body? Yes. In States Exhibit 30, Dr. Cruz, can you tell us what we are seeing in this photograph? This is an identification photograph of Mrs. Jackson. So it's a head-on shot of just her face. Uh, here we can also appreciate a number of injuries, including two gunshot wounds. And on the bottom center-ish of the photograph, I'm circling um, what appears to be an injury. Yes. Would, would you agree that that is an injury? Yes. 
And would you agree that that injury is caused by a gunshot wound? Yes. And then an injury at the top center of the photograph to Melissa Jackson's left eye area, would you agree that that is also a gunshot wound? Yes. Are there any other injuries in this photograph um, from this vantage point that you appreciate or can't appreciate in this photo? She also has an additional injury um, in the scalp at the hairline. Am I pointing at that right now? Yes. Kind of center scalp line? Yes. In States Exhibit 31, is in States Exhibit 31, Dr. Cruz, how do you describe this injury in your autopsy report? In my autopsy report, I describe this as a laceration or a tearing of the scalp. And when you say or a tearing of the scalp, is a tearing of skin how you define a laceration? Yes. Is a laceration different than, or could it be considered um, what I would describe as a grazing wound from a bullet? Uh, it's definitely possible that that could represent a graze wound from a bullet. In your opinion, just to be clear, could this laceration be a grazing wound? Yes. And when we say a grazing wound, can you explain what we mean by a grazing wound? A grazing wound is when the bullet uh, makes contact with the skin, um, but does not truly enter into the body and it kind of skirts along the surface of that skin. Looking then, Dr. Cruz, at States Exhibit 32, can you describe for us what we're seeing in this photograph? This is a photograph of Mrs. Jackson's left eye. Uh, so at the outer edge, so to the right of the photograph as we're looking at it, is a gunshot entrance wound, and it's near the center of that black circle at the edge of her eye. If I put my cursor in this area, would you agree that my cursor is hovering over the actual entrance wound of that gunshot? Yes. Can you explain to us what this dark circle is that surrounds the entrance wound? That dark circle represents densely deposited soot. Uh, so that soot that came out of the barrel of the gun and then deposited onto that skin. And it's pretty deeply embedded in the skin um, at this point. Um, also surrounding that wound, so going to the outer edges of that black circle, um, mostly toward the bottom edge of it, we see little teeny tiny puncture sort of marks, little red dots, um, that is stippling. So that's that unburnt gunpowder um, making contact with the skin and causing an abrasion. Can you tell us what the embedding of the soot and the stippling shown in this photograph tells you? Uh, they, to me, represent that that gun was likely quite close to the surface of the skin, um, most likely within inches. Moving on to States Exhibit 34, can you tell us what we're looking at in this image, Dr. Cruz? This is the right side of Mrs. Jackson's face, and in the right temple forehead region is a second gunshot entrance wound. Looking at States Exhibit 33, is this the same wound shown in 34 from a closer angle? Yes. In this photograph, or while you performed your autopsy, did you observe regarding the injury to the right temple, any of the same stippling or soot deposits around this injury? 
No, I did not. There is some black sort of discoloration you can see at the top area, um, but really doesn't have that soot-like appearance to it. Um, it's just more so discoloration of the skin that has a darker tone. And based on the lack of soot and stippling shown in the injury to the right temple area, did you form an opinion regarding the distance from which this injury occurred? Due to the lack of those findings, I can't say how far away the gun was. I just don't have evidence that it was up really close. Would you opine that this shot was from further away than the injury to her left eye? In the absence of anything between the two to stop that, um, then yes. And in States Exhibit 35, can you tell us what we're seeing in this photograph? So this is the right side of her head, um, sort of near the top. Um, this is a lacerated wound, so tearing of the skin, but what it represents is a partial exit wound um, from one of the bullets. Uh, so part of the bullet was able to poke through, um, but much of it also stayed within the head, and that was recovered. Were you able to tell which of the bullet wounds, uh, whether the left eye or the right temple, had this as the exit path? Yes, the one to the right eye had this partial exit wound. And can you tell us, Dr. Cruz, what we are seeing in States Exhibit 36? I these are the two bullet fragments that were recovered um, from her body associated with the two gunshot wounds. Um, so here, the one that says right parietal scalp lateral means that that bullet was found in the most outer sort of part of the head, and that was associated with the gunshot wound to the left eye. Um, and the one that says the right parietal scalp medial was associated with the gunshot wound to the right eye temple area um, and also associated with that partial exit wound. You can see it's a little smaller. Can you tell us, Dr. Cruz, what injuries resulted as a result of the gunshot wound to the right side of the face? Uh, to the right side of the face, uh, that bullet entered into the cranial cavity. So there was, again, injury to the skull, that dura, that outer covering, and the brain, and then associated bleeding on top of the brain. And what about the injuries as a result of the gunshot wound to the left eye? Uh, the gunshot wound to the left eye also in, injured that skull, the dura, the brain, and then that left eye itself and had associated bleeding with that. You mentioned earlier in your testimony that the cause of death related to Melissa Jackson was gunshot wounds of the head, correct? Correct. Were you able to establish which gunshot wound specifically was the fatal shot? No. Could either of them been fatal? Yes. You also then performed an autopsy on Sabrina Jackson, is that correct? Correct. And Dr. Cruz, can you tell us whether or not you formed an opinion as to the cause of death for Sabrina Jackson? Yes, I did. And what was her cause of death? Multiple gunshot wounds. Dr. Cruz, if you can look in that binder one more time for me, please, specifically focusing on exhibits 37 through 49, and let me know once you've had a chance to review those. Had, your, had a chance? Yes.
Dr. Cruz, the photos that you observed in exhibits 37 through 49, were those photographs taken by you during the autopsy of Sabrina Jackson? Yes. And the photographs that are depicted in those exhibits, did they fairly and accurately show the images and injuries that you observed during that autopsy? Yes. Your Honor, at this time, the state would move to have exhibits 37 through 49 admitted into evidence. Mr. Johnson? No additional objections, Your Honor, than what has previously been stated. All right, then at this time, states exhibits 37 through 49 are admitted. Permission to publish those exhibits, Your Honor. You may. Dr. Cruz, once again, looking at exhibit 37, can you tell us what we're seeing in this photograph? These are those two items on the outside of the body bag. So that locking tag with the number and the identification tag with Ms. Jackson's name. And in exhibit 38, what are we viewing here? This is that as is photograph of Ms. Jackson as she was received. So the photo was taken right after that body bag was opened. And her hands, are they also in brown paper sacks? Yes. It would appear to me, Dr. Cruz, that there is an additional piece of material or fabric surrounding Sabrina Jackson in the bag. Can you tell us what that is? Yes, that is a fitted bed sheet. And did that arrive inside of the body bag with Sabrina Jackson? Yes, exactly as it is shown. Looking then at States Exhibit 39, is this the tag that was on Sabrina Jackson's body? Yes. And were you able, Dr. Cruz, to confirm that the tag on Sabrina Jackson's body matched that of the tag on the body bag? Yes. Looking first at Exhibit 40, can you tell us where the injury seen in Exhibit 40 was on the body? This is on that lateral left side of the torso, like the left sort of flank region. And can you tell us what injuries were caused from this gunshot wound? I hear the bullet entered into the abdominal cavity, it first injured the diaphragm, um, which separates the chest from ad abdominal cavities. It then injured the stomach um, and the liver um, before exiting on sort of the right side of the anterior torso, kind of the front region. And is States Exhibit 43 a zoomed in photograph of that same bullet wound? Yes. When looking at the bullet wound in Exhibit 40 and Exhibit 43, did you find any evidence during your autopsy of any soot deposits or stippling? No. In States Exhibit 42, can you tell us where this injury was? Uh, so this injury represents that exit wound on that front side of the abdomen um, associated with the entrance wound on the left flank. And States Exhibit 41, can you tell us what part of the body we're looking at here? This is the right arm. Um, so it's the anterior portion, meaning if your arms are down and your palms are facing forward, it's that front part. Was there anything as far as a projectile recovered from either the wound to the abdomen, what I would refer to as the stomach area, the, the side or that arm? There was one projectile recovered and it was in the arm. When you wrote your autopsy report, Dr. Cruz, how many different gunshot wounds did you attribute to these three injuries that have been um, shown in exhibits 40, 41, 42, and 43? I counted those as two gunshot wounds, so one to that abdom abdominal stomach area and then one to the arm. 
And was there an additional gunshot wound that you found on Sabrina Jackson's body? Yes. Looking at State's Exhibit 44, can you explain to us what we see here? Uh, this is Miss Jackson's left eye, and at the outer edge of that upper eyelid is a gunshot entrance wound. Can you describe for us the injuries that resulted from this gunshot wound? Uh, this gunshot wound injured the eye, uh, then it injured the skull, uh, dura, uh, and the brain, and caused bleeding onto the brain. Dr. Cruz, regarding Sabrina Jackson, did you form an opinion regarding the cause of death? Yes. And what was that opinion? Multiple gunshot wounds. Your Honor, will you darken my screen for one second, please? I'm ready to publish. Excuse me. Looking at State's Exhibit 45, Dr. Cruz, can you tell us what we are seeing in this photograph? This is a photo of Miss Jackson's body after it has been cleaned and that clothing and the bedsheet have been removed. In this photograph, are you able or are we able to see the wound that you labeled in your report as B, the lateral left side of mid-abdomen? No. It's right on that lateral edge, so you just can't appreciate it from this photograph. The injury in what could potentially be the chest or upper abdomen of Sabrina Jackson, is this the entry, or excuse me, the, the wound that you referred to as the exit wound? Yes. Dr. Cruz, depending on the position of Sabrina Jackson's body at the time that she sustained the gunshot wounds, is it possible that the left side wound exited the center of her chest and that same bullet then re-entered her arm. Yes. So though you have marked down three gunshot wounds, is it possible that only two bullets struck her body? Yes. Based on the bullet path and the injuries that were sustained in those three injuries to the abdomen, my word, not yours, the midsection and the arm. Mm -hmm. Are you able to form an opinion as to whether or not Sabrina Jackson would have been able to roll over after having been shot there? She definitely could have been able to move. Looking at State's Exhibit 46, can you tell us what we're seeing in this photograph? This is Miss Jackson's shirt that she was wearing. And when you say Miss Jackson, are we referring to Sabrina Jackson? Sabrina Jackson. Dr. Cruz, just briefly, there were not photographs taken um, or similar photographs laid out like this of the uh, clothing worn by Melissa Jackson. Is that because there were no um, defects to the clothing? That is correct. And I'm circling my cursor center of this shirt. There appears to be a little white dot. Is that the defect that you observed on this sh shirt? Yes. And do you attribute that defect to a bullet hole? I do. And would that be the exit wound bullet hole that you referred to? Yes. State's Exhibit 47, is this that same bullet hole zoomed in? Yes, it is. And State's Exhibit 48, can you tell us what we are seeing here? Uh, this is the bullet that was recovered from the soft tissue of the right arm. And in State's Exhibit 49, what are we seeing? This is a fragmented bullet that was recovered from the head associated with that gunshot wound to the left eye. And when you refer to it as fragmented, what does that mean to you? 
to me, it means it represents one bullet that had broken into pieces. Can you describe for us, Dr. Cruz, where on or where in Sabrina Jackson's body this projectile was taken from? Uh, so most of these are tiny fragments that I believe, if I remember correctly, came from bone, but most came from that right parietal region. So actually looking back at Melissa Jackson's injury with that lacerated exit wound and where she also had bullets recovered, um, I also recovered this fragmented projectile from Sabrina Jackson. Were you, Dr. Cruz, able to form, I can have the lights back, please. Were you able, Dr. Cruz, to form an opinion regarding the distance from which Sabrina Jackson was shot in her left side? I did not have any evidence of soot or stippling, so I was not able to determine range of fire. And again, if there was clothing or bed covers in between the barrel of the gun and her skin, would that affect the ability to find soot and or stippling? Yes. Similarly, did you form an opinion regarding the distance from which Sabrina Jackson received the injury to her eye? Correct. And did you in the injury or around the injury to Sabrina Jackson's eye, did you observe any of that soot embedded or stippling? No, I did not. Were you able to determine through your autopsy which of the gunshot wounds to Sabrina Jackson actually caused her death? Similar to the other gunshot wounds, each one is potentially fatal. Um, however, the gunshot wound to her head would have been more rapidly fatal. When you're doing autopsies, is part of what you do during an autopsy to identify the, um, the bodies in which you're examining? Yes, we say it's the most important thing we do. And during the autopsy, did you identify the body that was tagged as Jan Jackson to actually be Jan Jackson? I did. And the body that was tagged as Melissa Jackson, did you identify or make, uh, were, did you identify that body to be Melissa Jackson? Yes. And the body that came in that was tagged as Sabrina Jackson, did you also identify that body to actually be Sabrina Jackson? Yes. I don't have any further questions, Your Honor. Mr. Johnson, cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Doctor. Good afternoon. You testified earlier about what you described as stippling and soot deposits on a wound. Remember that? Yes. And... That to you indicated a certain proximity of the weapon to the injury. Would that be correct? That's correct. And with that deposit of that, is there also the possibility that blood or uh, tissue from the person being shot could blow back onto the weapon itself? Yes, I assume that's possible. And that even the person who was firing that weapon could possibly get blood or tissue on them depending on how close the wound was. That seems reasonable. So a, a gun that was within inches of one of these injuries, the muzzle of that gun could potentially have DNA on it from the victim. Potentially, yes. As well as the assailant could potentially have DNA on them from the victim. Potentially, yes. As well as they could potentially have uh, deposits of gunshot residue on their hands. Potentially, yes. And you did note, at least with respect to Melissa Jackson, that you believe that that gun was in close range to her. Correct. Uh, 
You also, as part of your job, you do a toxicology analysis as well, don't you? Correct. And that's just to make sure that any of the victims didn't have any excessive amounts of any kind of drugs in their body. Is that one of the reasons? Correct. And none of the victims in this case had any drugs of abuse in their body, did they? Correct. Um, no alcohol, Correct. right? No heroin, right? Correct. No cocaine, any of that, anything like that? No, not that was detected, no. And you are aware of the effects of, of these drugs that it might have on the human condition, right? I'm aware they can have effects, and they do affect everyone differently. And um, are you aware of the drug fentanyl? Yes. And what is fentanyl? Fentanyl is an opioid, um, and it is prescribed in a hospital setting, um, but is now quite common outside of the hospital. In the hospital setting, what is it used for? It is used to help with pain, um, and it's used often in conjunction with sedatives um, for different procedures. Is it true that fentanyl is 50 times stronger than heroin? I'd have to look at the numbers, but it's much stronger, yes. And it's also 100 times stronger than morphine? Uh, yes, and as a caveat, uh, morphine is part of heroin. Okay. Thank you for that. And some of the side effects of fentanyl can be extreme euphoria. Is that right? It can have different effects on different people. And it can also cause confusion. I suppose someone could get confused. I mean, but these are some of the indications with that drug that are commonly known, correct? I assume it's on, I know there is a long list of different side effects of different sort of medications, and I wouldn't argue that that's not part of the list. But you would agree that it can affect uh, anybody differently? Correct. Who, uh, I noticed on the tags of those bodies was the name Alicia Weber. Can you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury who Alicia Weber is? So Iowa has 99 counties, and as part of those counties, they have a county medical examiner. Um, those are physicians that essentially triage cases for us at the state office and determines who needs an autopsy. Um, they also oversee investigators who go to scenes, um, tag bodies, put bodies in body bags, and Alicia Weber is one of those investigators for Lynn County. So would it be fair to say that she might go to a crime scene and, uh, I don't know, look, look at the bodies as they are, appear on, in, at the crime scene? Correct. Do you know whether she did that in this case or not? I, she had to have been there for that tagging, um, for tagging all of the bodies and putting them in the body bags. Um, I'm not sure how involved she was since their you know, law enforcement and others were there, but she had to have been there for that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then with respect to the autopsy of Jan Jackson, it's, it sounded to me like um, you have some doubts about how close the weapon might have been to some of those injuries. Is that true? I don't have evidence of close range, and in those cases I just don't know because things can get in the way um, of soot and stippling for me to know for sure. Things like? bloody clothing, right? You, I think you said you look at the clothing, but if there's blood on it, you might not see the soot or the stippling, right? Correct, it may obscure that soot and stippling, and I only look at it with the naked eye. And Mr. Jackson's hair that you had to shave off on the back of his head, that could have also concealed soot and stippling as well. With the soot, correct. Okay, and for those reasons, if, if the person doing the shooting had been in very close proximity to Mr. Jackson, they again could have got deposits of Mr. Jackson's blood or tissue on themselves. Yes, or, that's, yes. Or, or the firearm itself could have had that on the muzzle, for example, of the gun. Yes. Thank you, I don't have any further questions. Any redirect, Ms. Slaughter? Just briefly, Your Honor. Dr. Cruz, um, Mr. Johnson asked you a line of questioning uh, regarding the effects of fentanyl? Yes. Would you agree that there are several factors that go into how fentanyl would affect any specific person? 
Correct. Age. Correct. Ex Wh weight. Weight is possibility. Any other factors you can think of? Uh, you know, if someone has used it before, it may affect them differently when they use it subsequent times. Um, your body may metabolize the drug differently. Um, you may have other drugs in your system. Um, just a long list of why it may affect different people differently. In your lengthy uh, educational background and training and on-the-job experience, do you have any specific training related to blowback from guns as far as bullet hits body and which directionality blood travels? No, we do not. And really our experience with that is what we see um, at autopsy and most commonly when people shoot themselves. And when you say most commonly when people shoot themselves, if a bullet is traveling in a direction, most commonly do you see that the blood travels in the same direction as the bullet? Correct. It can travel in that direction, potentially in the opposite direction, but you're almost guaranteed for it to go in the direction of the bullet and not so much so in the opposite direction. Would the size and strength of the bullet in the gun, in your opinion, doctor, have an effect on the blood traveling in the opposite direction from the bullet? Um, in my experience, I have seen that um, different types of ammunition and different weapons do produce different sorts of patterns of blood spatter and injury. And so when you say you assume that's possible and that it seems reasonable, are you forming an opinion as to that is what happened in this case or should have happened in this case as far as the blood blowing back towards the gun? No, not at all. I don't have any further questions, Your Honor. Mr. Johnson? But I think I heard you just say that you see it blow back most often when people shoot themselves. That I'm able to um, witness whether blowback exists or not with people who shoot themselves, because it's what we commonly see at our office. Because that weapon would be in close proximity to that injury. Correct. All right, and if the blood were to shoot back up in the same direction as the bullet, it's more likely to be deposited on the muzzle of that gun. Is that correct? Could you repeat that? I'm sorry. Because, because the blowback of the blood would shoot back in the direction of the bullet, and somebody was shooting themselves, so they were in, had to be in close proximity, then the blood would shoot back up on, have more of an opportunity to shoot back onto the gun. Correct. It, with the close proximity, if blood were to shoot back, meaning it doesn't always happen, you should see it. Should see it on the weapon. Correct. Thank you. I don't have any further questions. Ms. Slaughter? Nothing additional, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, Dr. Cruz. Thank you. You are uh, free to go and may step down. And ladies and gentlemen, this will be a, a good time, I think, to take our mid-afternoon break. Um, we always give you 15 minutes. We don't always get 15 minutes then because there's always a couple things we're gonna, we, we do. Um, so I think probably right now I've got about 3.10 on my watch. We're just going to go till 3.30. Uh, we'll give you a few minutes longer, and that way we can make sure to get our 15 minutes as well. So I'd remind you of the admonition that I gave you previously, and we'll see you shortly. All right. Right, go ahead and have a seat. There's just one thing I want to clarify for the record. I think it's pretty easy, but uh, obviously with all of those autopsy photos, um, you know, we had, you'd already made your objection, Mr. Johnston, but with respect to, I think, the autopsy photos for Melissa Jackson, 27 through 36, you stated something to the effect, other than sta as stated at the bench, 
I just want to make it clear there was no additional bench conference related to objections. The objection was made on the record previously and addressed then. So I just want to, so the record's clear, there was no additional objection made at the bench that's not part of the record. Is that correct, Mr. No, Johnson? No, Your Honor, I misspoke there. I just meant the yeah. same as the previous two. I, I knew that to be the case, but I just wanted the record to be clear. Um, and then I think we can go off the record at this point. You guys just want to come up with a couple of potential objections. All right, we're back on the record after our uh, mid-afternoon recess. We have uh, our jurors, counsel, Mr. Jackson present. We had just finished up, you, I'm sure you recall, with Dr. Cruz. And um, Ms. Slaughter, the microphone's in front of you, so I'm assuming you're going. Does the state have another witness to call at this point? State calls Brandon Bosenberg, Your Honor. All right. Good afternoon, Mr. Bosenberg. I'm going to have you have a seat right over there to my far left, if you would. You can go ahead and have a seat. Can you do me a favor real quick? There's a book underneath the book you just brought up. Would you close yes. that? You can just set it off. You may be asked to look at it, but here you are. Let's just keep it closed. Thank you. All right. Uh, Mr. Posenberg, first thing I'm going to do is swear you in. Please raise your right hand. Sir, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you'll be giving today will be the truth? I do. All right. And just for the record, can you provide us with your first and last name? Yes, my uh, name is Brandon Bosenberg. And could you spell your spell in both, please? Yes. Uh, Brandon is B-R-A-N-D-O-N. Bosenberg is B-O-E-S-E-N-B-E-R-G. All right. Thank you. Ms. Slaughter? Thank you, Your Honor. Investigator Bosenberg, how are you currently employed? I currently work for Collins Aerospace right now. And how long have you been employed with Collins Aerospace? Uh, approximately three months. Prior to your employment with Collins, how were you employed? Before that, I was employed with the Cedar Rapids Police Department. And what years did you work as a police officer for the Cedar Rapids Police Department? I worked for the Cedar Rapids Police Department from 2009 to 2022. Can you tell us just briefly why your employment ended with CRPD? Yes, I took a medical retirement uh, from the police department. 
Investigator Bosenberg, can you tell us a little bit about your educational background? So I went to University of Northern Iowa from 2002 to 2006 and graduated with a uh, bachelor's degree in criminology. And did you then attend the Iowa Law Enforcement Academy? I did. And which academy did you attend? Uh, I've actually attended two different academies. In 2008, I attended the Iowa Law Enforcement Academy that's located in Des Moines, Iowa, Johnston, Iowa. And then in 2009, I attended the Cedar Rapids Police Department Academy. Prior to working for the Cedar Rapids Police Department, did you have other law enforcement experience? Yes, I spent two and a half years working for the Lynn County Sheriff's Department. As a deputy sheriff? Correct. And then transferred to Cedar Rapids Police Department? Yes. Upon transferring to Cedar Rapids Police Department, is that when you had to take some additional courses through the academy for that employment? Yes. When you first started your employment with Cedar Rapids Police Department, what position did you hold? So when I first started the police department, I was a patrol officer. And how long were you a patrol officer? I was on patrol from 2009 to 2014. And in 2014, what about your employment changed? Uh, in 2014, I joined the criminal investigative division as a nighttime investigative officer. And when you say criminal investigative division, is that sometimes or commonly referred to through CRPD as the CID unit? Yes. And you said as a nighttime what? Uh, night investigator. Can you tell us what a night investigator does working uh, as part of the CID? Yep. So it was part of a unit that we called um, the MAT unit. It's called Mobile Assist Team. Uh, it was a plainclothes investigative unit. Uh, so our duties were to investigate any crimes that would happen at night uh, that didn't rise to the occasion of calling in the crime scene unit. Uh, so we would process crime scenes. We would do investigations um, mainly that happened at night. When you were part of the MAT team, tell us how you would become involved in different investigations. Uh, so frequently, uh, as patrol officers would get sent to calls and they realized that an investigator was needed to follow up with the case, that's when the, um, our unit would get called to come in and finish the investigation. Now, you said that you would participate as part of the MAT team in investigations that did not rise to the level of needing the crime scene unit to come in. Is that correct? Correct. Where is that line drawn where it's something that the MAT team or the mobile assist team can handle versus bringing in the crime scene unit? Uh, one of the clear lines was homicides. As a MAT investigator, we wouldn't investigate homicides, uh, but we would investigate assaults, serious assaults, um, narcotics crimes. Um, if a homicide happened, then the crime scene unit would come in and handle that. So you possibly would do a shooting as long as it didn't result in a death? Yes. Or a stabbing as long as it didn't result in a death? Yes. And you said also narcotics, so drug deal type of investigations? Yes. Okay. How does a police officer come to be a part of this mobile assist team? Uh, there's a competitive application process as a position opens up on like a, an investigative unit. Uh, they'll open it up to the department and anybody that wants to be a part of that unit will apply and go through an application interview process and then get selected on an, an, like an interview panel. Once you are selected and chosen to be part of this mobile assist team, are you then equipped with additional training, um, specialized training that, that assists you in doing the jobs that come with that? There's a uh, so of part of investigations, even as a patrol officer. Um, me specifically, I've attended numerous different uh, trainings and classes and seminars over the years. Uh, and so when you become a part of the investigative unit, you take classes that are tailored towards investigations. So uh, throughout my years as an investigator, um, I went to multiple different classes uh, throughout those years. Without 
going into specific details about each of these trainings, can you give us an idea or a couple of examples of the types of training that you would receive in addition to basic training that, that would be necessary for your job as an investigator? Uh, sure, so uh, a couple, so I've been to a few different um, interview uh, technique classes. I went to a, a two-week homicide class various different classes that cover a lot of different aspects of um, investigations. I uh, went to a handful of narcotics-related investigation classes. Uh, and then later on, I attended some other uh, more specialty uh, schools. And what type of specialty schools did you attend? Uh, so later on, I became a member of the crime scene unit, and I attended a, a week-long photography school. Uh, I went to a week-long uh, crime scene investigation school and also attended a uh, latent print examination, uh, just technically called the Science of Friction Ridge Detail uh, class. Science and Friction Ridge Detail? Sorry, yeah, the Science of Friction Ridge Detail. Is that fingerprinting? Yes. And when you reference latent, does that just mean a fingerprint? Yes, uh, latent usually refers to um, something that's not visibly seen right away, kind of like an unknown print. So when we refer to latent print, it's one that hasn't been completely developed into a print uh, that we can visibly see. You said that you took um, specialized or went to a specialized training school on photography. Is that correct? Yes. Can you tell us why, as a part of the crime scene, unit that photography is important? Sure. Uh, photography is very important with crime scenes. Uh, during any type of crime scene, we only get one chance to, to fully document that crime scene. Uh, and one of the best ways to do that is through photography. Uh, photo photographs are good indefinitely. Uh, so once we take those, it properly documents how we saw the scene uh, and different aspects of the scene. Uh, so we can refer to those later and be able to present what we saw uh, to others as well. What, when you transitioned from the mobile assist team into the crime scene unit, what year was that? Well, so in between those two units, in 2017, I actually uh, became a member of the uh, narcotics investigative team. And so from 2017 to January of 2020, I was with narcotics. And then in January of 2020, I joined the uh, crime scene unit. What did you do when you were with uh, the narcotics unit? Uh, narcotics was all about uh, investigating uh, narcotics crimes. So um, we would just run a lot of different narcotics investigations. And then to get onto the crime scene unit or into the crime scene unit, can you tell us what that application process looked like? Yeah, very similar to each uh, process that I've been through um, in the investigative unit. There's an application process and an interview process that I went through to get selected for that position. So in one capacity or another, would it be fair to say, Investigator Bosenberg, that you were an investigator in one capacity or another from 2014 through 2022 when you retired? Yes. Other than Matt team, narcotics, in the crime scene unit, were you a part of any other um, investigative units? No. How, if at all, does the crime scene unit differ from that of the mobile assist team? Uh, so the crime scene unit is uh, mainly uh, designed to investigate crime scenes and do evidence processing at the station. Uh, whereas on the MAT unit, uh, if we weren't investigating a crime scene, we were just um, proactive officers in plain clothes and plain cars out doing kind of like a hybrid patrol function um, as an investigator. Uh, but as a crime scene unit investigator, our sole job is just investigating crime scenes and processing evidence uh, from crime scenes. How do you come to be involved in a case that requires members of the crime scene unit to show up? Uh, there's a few different paths to uh, getting involved. Uh, it all kind of depends on what we're doing. Uh, a lot of times, uh, if a big event happens, um, commanders that will be on patrol will either notify commanders in the investigative division, 
and then that filters down to the resources that are needed to handle a case. Uh, so in bigger cases, we're usually notified through um, our commander. Uh, other times we all have police radio, so we would be listening to the radio uh, frequently and we might hear an incident come out over the radio uh, that we might understand to know that needs uh, a crime scene unit investigator. When you either get sent or hear a call and are going to respond to a crime scene, Do you have a kit or something? Are there certain instruments that you take with you to every crime scene? Yes, so uh, as a crime scene investigator, we all have our own vehicles that are outfitted with all the tools that we need uh, to uh, process a crime scene. Uh, a lot of like personal protective equipment uh, for crime scenes. There's uh, items to um, process for latent prints, um, evidence collection. We have a lot of different assortment of tools to uh, process a crime scene that are all within our vehicle. So when we do get a call, we don't have to load up every time we get called. We just have that all readily available in our vehicle and respond to a scene. Investigator Bosenberg, were you a member of the crime scene unit on June 15th of 2021? Yes, I was. Did you become involved into homicide investigation taking place at 4414 Oak Leaf Court Northeast? Yes. Can you recall specifically regarding that case how you came to be involved? Uh, that morning at the time, uh, Lieutenant Fitzpatrick was our uh, commander in charge of the crime scene unit, and he had received notification that there was an incident in progress at 4414 Oakleaf Court, uh, and uh, so we turned on our radios to monitor the, the radio traffic that was as the incident was unfolding. When you got the call about that incident, as you call it, uh, what information were you provided prior to heading in that direction? Uh, first, there wasn't a whole lot of information uh, that was coming out. Uh, but I did hear that there was a, a male subject going to the hospital with a gunshot wound. Uh, so that was my first task was to go to the hospital. And can you recall what hospital you went to? Uh, St. Luke's, I believe. When you got to St. Luke's Hospital, um, did you make contact with Alexander Jackson? Yes, I did. And is Alexander Jackson in this courtroom today? Yes, he is. Can you point him out, describe an article of clothing he's wearing, please? Uh, yes, he's sitting over at that table on the left in a suit. Uh, white shirt? Yes, white shirt. Goatee? Yes. Your Honor, if the record could reflect that this witness identified the defendant? The record so reflects. Investigator Bosenberg, when you made contact with the defendant at the hospital, can you tell us where he was? So I actually arrived at the hospital before he did. Um, so when I was at the hospital, um, they, the ambulance brought him in and put him into an uh, emergency room, and then that's where I had contact with him at. When you made contact with him, did he appear to be injured? Yes. And what part of his body did you observe injuries on? Uh, he had an injury to his left foot. Yes. Can you explain why that is? Yes, sure. So, uh, oh, no, sorry. Uh, the fly through, uh, when I created the fly through, it was done at an elevated angle. Uh, but obviously, the laser scanner, we didn't put up that high in the air. So, when the laser scanner's on the ground, it's much like a camera. Um, whatever the laser scanner can see from its current vantage point is what's captured. 
Uh, so like a lot of times there might be a roof line that wasn't there or some walls behind like a tree. Uh, since the laser scanner couldn't see that in its various positions as we moved it around the house, um, that actual data of like that roof line wasn't captured. Uh, so it's actually capturing the data from underneath it that we had taken inside the house. So that's why you might see um, like an open roof line or a, a section of a wall missing. Yes. Is that part of the imaging system? Yes, that's uh, some equipment that comes along with this Faro laser scanner.
in the Pharaoh scan, there were some parts of the images where it was apparent that there were some evidence markers set. Is that correct? Yes. Can you firstly tell us what an evidence marker is? Sure. So an evidence marker, as we saw at the beginning of the indoor one, uh, they're just a yellow piece of plastic with different numbers on them uh, that we use to note, denote uh, various items of evidence. Were additional evidence markers used after the scans were completed? Yes. Is there a reason for that, why some are done up front and some are done later? Yes, so kind of as I was explaining earlier, um, so what we did is after overall photographs were taken, we went and marked all the obvious pieces of evidence, and then once all the obvious pieces of evidence were done, we uh, brought the scanner in to scan it. Uh, additional items of evidence were marked later, uh, but at that point the priority was kind of capturing what we could see with our naked eye without disturbing any of the scene, uh, and then also, we needed to capture the data from the decedents uh, so we could start that process of get them to the medical examiner's um, office. Overall, how many days was this house process? Uh, total, we were there um, on four different days. Generally, when there is a crime scene, is the crime scene held or processed for four days? No. What, if any, factors contributed to how many days or the length that this crime scene was processed? Yeah, so on this one, uh, just the number, having three decedents in the house uh, was a, definitely a factor, and uh, having them in all in different areas um, added to the time it took to process this scene. I don't know what Your Honor's position is, but for my line of question, this might be a good place to break. We're close enough. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, I guess with that, um, we will and just so you can rest assured, I talked to the attorneys earlier. We're still on schedule. So, um, um, so with that, we'll let you go for the night. I would remind you again of the admonition, again, just before we break for a longer period of time. I'm going to hit the high points again. Um, again, keep an open mind. Don't come to any decisions in this case yet. Um, do not uh, do any sort of investigation. Do not communicate with anybody about this case or let anybody communicate with you. And again, uh, avoid all uh, media related to this case um, as long as you're a juror. So with that, uh, have a good evening, everybody. And we'll be ready to go by 9 o'clock tomorrow. Bosenberg, you could step down and you're free to go for today. I believe you're needed back here at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Uh, thank you. Go ahead and have a seat, everybody. Just before we all adjourn for the day, just checking, is there anything we need to address on the record from the state's end? No, Your Honor. Mr. Johnson? All right, then we'll call it a day for ourselves as well. I think there may be a couple things to take up tomorrow morning, so um, uh, 8.45 or so, if you're here ready and we can make a record. I, I think Mr. Johnson wanted to talk about the video sometime. Yes, I believe so. Yep. And I think we talked about the video. I mean, we made a record on the video before lunch. I came back. I mean, I guess I, I, I agreed with the <laughs> defense that parts of it really had nothing to do with what, you know, it was supposedly demonstrative of. My understanding is, I think that was on the record, you had no objection with the edits as far as the time that were made and, um, 
and uh, your only remaining objection was just the voice over. Is that correct, Mr. Johnson? Yes. All right. Go ahead. I don't know. Um, it's up on my computer screen if you want to see it and know which photo we're talking about. I could just look at the book. I'll do that and I mean, make a very quick record on it in the morning. Okay. Um, and the only other thing is just at some point I am going to need the state to submit electronically the map as 160, and then we'll need to add a copy, make sure we have a copy up here marked as 160 to go back to the jury. So. Uh, All right. All right. Then we'll let Kathy... Conclude the record. And you're going to take that with you? All right. I do not. As far as I'm, you know, nothing else is happening in here.